Tra-la, tra-la. The bees are going. Tra-la, tra-la. Tra-la, tra-la. The cardinals are coming. Tra-la, tra-la. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the opening drive on 101 ESPN in St. Louis, where it's 7 o'clock. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. Brooke Grimsley is here. Danny Mack is here. Matthew Rocchio is here. I'm Randy Carricker. Great to have you with us on this Wednesday morning, this hump day, this Ask Uncle Randy day, this morning after a Cardinals 5-2 win over the Padres, and the Cardinals are now, Brooke Grimsley, a 500 ball club Yes. Here we go. I Look, I'm pumped up. I stayed up last night for that game. Miles Michaelis with his first quality start of the season. Mm-hmm. And, guys, we saw some small ball. And we also have seen pitching. I mean, Lance Lynn on Saturday, four innings, no runs. Matt's five and a third, two earned. Gibson, seven innings, two nights ago, two earned. Michaelis last night, six innings, two earned. That's 22 and a third and six earned runs. That is your recipe with a little small ball mixed in and a timely home run or two, but pitching sets the tone. And they've had great starting pitching, and that has given them a chance to win these games. The uh, Cardinals are doing what Cardinal baseball should be. This this is the Cardinal way. It's speed, it's defense, it's fundamentals. And in these last couple of games, they've done the things that the Cardinals have always done since George Kissel arrived on the scene to win games. I'm not saying they're going to be like this for 162, but they are going to be like this for 162. But uh, this is what you need to do. When you have a team that isn't as talented, hey, let's all be honest. Bogarts and Machado and Tatis and uh, you Darvish, the, that group over there is more talented than the Cardinals. But the Cardinals did the little things necessary to win a game last night. Especially the small ball in the third inning when you were able to manufacture a run there. The way that they were able to just score their first run in the game, I felt like sparked a lot. You have that hustle double by Victor Scott. There's not many players who could pull that off. Then you have the bunt by Siani to move Scott mm-hmm. over to third. And then you have win with the sack fly. It made the game one nothing, but I just love the relentless nature and the ability to manufacture runs in any way possible. We were looking for that so many times last season where it's like, okay, do anything, show some aggressiveness. And that's what they're able to show. It's crazy to me that there were some people on social media last night on X that didn't like that. Yeah, some, some people don't like winning. So uh, how can you, uh, what do you expect? Do you you really think that Victor Scott and Siani and Wynn are going to hit back-to-back-to-back home runs? No. So that group has to play that way. Scott with a double to right, Siani with the sacrifice. Nice bunt, by the way. And then uh, Mason Wynn stepping in to get the run home. And that sacrifice fly tied the game at one apiece. And then the Cardinals in the bottom of the, or in the top of the sixth inning, get the two run homer from Wilson Contreras to take the lead 3 2. And they wind up winning by a score of 5 to 2. Brendan Donovan with a really heads up play in the game last night, too, with the bases loaded, running from third mm-hmm. and staying upright, not sliding, kind of blocking the view of the third baseman to get the ball in or even the pitcher. I thought that was just a heads up play. And he's a smart, really smart baseball player. And that's why you call him Donnie Baseball. You can put him anywhere in the diamond. He's going to give you good defensive effort. But little things like you talked about, guys, when you're not as – and, Randy, you mentioned it. They're not as talented as the Dodgers. They're not as talented in the lineup, I don't think, when you look at one through four, maybe even one through five with the Padres. It's, It's a good lineup. Don't get me wrong. But you have to do the little things, and that's what they're doing right now. And its I'll tell you the other thing about it. At the end of the day, this is entertainment. This has been entertaining to watch this style of baseball. Last year's team was not fun to watch. Mm-hmm. This team, because of the influx of youth, and let's throw Jordan Walker in there too, uh, with, with your young kids, with, with uh, Victor Scott, with Mason Wynn, with Jordan Walker, they're fun to watch. I'm in the camp of keeping Victor Scott the second here at this point because of the spark that he's providing, his speed, his ability to just, he's so confident and it seems secure out there. And I know that the bat will come with that, but I like that he is able to really hustle and you see that in every single moment. I thought this was interesting. Now, I told you guys that there would be people who would have some issues with the small ball. So from the 217, they don't need to actually bunt Scott over. He's fast enough to score from second on anything. There's nothing wrong with getting a runner over to third with less than two out, period. There's, yeah, you, I'm okay with it, too. How, however you do it, if you can get a runner to third with less than two out, and, you, and then you play fundamental baseball, it's a run. 
I'll be interested when they get into extra innings this year <laughs> if they bunt. Where yeah. most, you know, the 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 book will tell you do not bunt. But I'm with you, Randy. You put pressure on the defense with a runner at third less than two outs. Now, you may have to bring the infield in. Mm -hmm. Maybe you play him back. If you play him back, you're conceding the run more than likely. But if you're playing it in, opens up more holes and you put pressure on the defense. Victor Scott does that. Now, he is three for 22. Two of the hits have been doubles because of his speed. But when he's out there, he makes little things happen. He's fun to watch. And I, I don't want to get too far ahead here. He's three for 22 with eight strikeouts, third most on the team. But I'll tell you, of all the players that are in this lineup, he's the one I want to watch mm -hmm. probably more than anybody. Yeah. He really is because of what he's doing. Everything that you listed there, that is entertaining baseball. And also, we just keep doing the comparison of Vince Coleman. I just love that you can, can do that similarity right now in this day and age with the player. It just feels like a throwback player in the best way possible. It's what you want to see with this team right now. Mark McGuire was an intimidating offensive force. Albert Pujols was an intimidating offensive force. Uh, w w Matt Holliday was an intimidating offensive force when you saw him at the plate. In another way, Victor Scott is an intimidating offensive force for the defense. He intimidates the defense. The other guy that uh, is overlooked, we haven't even talked about him yet, is Wilson Contreras yep. with another home run. I thought he was the least talked about player in spring training mm -hmm. it, it, except for his defense they talked about pitch framing which by the way he is number one in baseball in stealing strikes right now mm -hmm. which may surprise a lot of people but this guy's a gamer he, he just is and i thought one of the bright spots of the second half of last year and there weren't many but it was him and how he came to play every single day with intensity and with a purpose and it's carried over to this year the guy is a gamer he's a good player and the other veteran players on this team are kind of flatliners with especially with newt bar not here nolan arnato is intense but he he doesn't outwardly show it all the time like Contreras says Paul Goldschmidt uh, uh, Brian Snicker called him the most bore in a complimentary way called Paul called Paul Goldschmidt the most boring player in baseball because he's just so darn consistent and fundamentals he doesn't change right but Wilson Contreras hits a home run and he's fired up somebody else does something good he's cheering in the dugout and the Cardinals from a veteran player need that and they get that from Contreras the fun finale of the series today 310 from Petco Park. Zach Thompson will go against Joe Musgrove. Then the Cardinals will fly home and open things up tomorrow at the ballpark. A 310 game against the winless Marlins. And we're going to be broadcasting live from the Budweiser Brew House at Ballpark Village tomorrow for opening day. Home opener is here tomorrow. And the opening drive, BK and Ferrario, and the fast lane all coming to you live. Tomorrow, from Ballpark Village, our opening day broadcast brought to you by Swiss Air Heating and Cooling, Holiday World and Splash and Safari, and by Budweiser. Meanwhile, y did you have something to add baseball-wise? Oh, no. It's just going to be cold tomorrow. That's all. It is, yeah. Oh, it's so yay. cold bring, for the home opener. Bring your big Cardinal Parco with you if you're going to the home <laughs> opener. You know, another thing about generating runs, just for a moment, you know, the Cardinals went 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position. They only had, what was it, six hits last night? Six hits mm -hmm. and you score mm -hmm. five runs. So that's something to keep in mind. And if you would have said before the season started that they would come home potentially four and three, I'd have said you're out of your mind. <laughs> I'd have oh. said you are out of your mind. No way. Me too. I, I thought two and five. To me, this is a win. To have three wins on this road trip is yes. a win coming home regardless of what happens today. And things lighten up when you come back home against Miami. Now it's going to ramp up again because the schedule is very tough in this first month. But it just gives this team, I think, a little jolt, a little confidence. And put last year behind you and say we're going to win some games this year and do it different ways and I thought they did that last night. Yep. I, I'm honestly surprised too just because I just bought into with the amount of injuries not just with Lars Newbar, Tommy Edmond and Dylan Carlson but also with some of your pitchers as well. I didn't know how this bullpen would look. One starting pitching what they've been able to do lately as you pointed out earlier Danny has a lot to do with that but even last night I liked what I saw with Andrew Kittredge. I think that he is going to be great for the bullpen this season. Yeah. All he needs to do is stay healthy, and he is he has been healthy. He was down the stretch last year, and hopefully we'll see the same from him. Hockey, the Blues announced that Jimmy Snuggerud will be staying another year at Minnesota. He's going to try to win a championship in uh, one more year with the Golden Gophers. Jeremy Rutherford writes in The Athletic, three days after the 6-3 defeat that prevented Snuggerud and his club from playing in the NCAA Frozen Four, laying his... In his bed at home on Tuesday morning, he made his decision. He was returning to the Gophers for his junior season. 
He said, quote, a couple of nights ago, I kind of felt like I wanted to sign, and then I woke up the next morning and didn't know again. So I just kind of sat by myself and thought about it all night, just kind of laying there thinking. Then this morning, I just had a real realization and a glimpse of what I thought next year could hold, but this was the hardest decision I've ever made in my life by far. It isn't close says Jimmy Snuggerud. Stinks for me. I want to see this kid play. <laughs> I want to see him up here, and I want to see offense. Yeah. And if he can generate that, then, you know, get him up here. I, I just, I was thinking that there are ways to somehow convince him that maybe, you know what, this is the right thing to do, not staying in college, but joining the St. Louis Blues. I get the sense that maybe the Blues couldn't or wouldn't guarantee NHL time if they signed him right now. And maybe that had something to do with it. When you're playing at the University of Minnesota, having fun, you got a chance to win a championship next year, or you could go to Springfield for a couple of weeks. Not, nothing wrong with Springfield, Massachusetts, but when you sign with the Blues, when you leave college, you're signing to go to the show. And Springfield's not the show. No, and I do get that. And maybe that is part of what happened there, but I don't necessarily think that it's a terrible thing. And just reading some of his quotes, it seemed like he really wanted to go back to Minnesota and continue to grow as a player Mm -hmm. and just get his numbers back up to what he has expectation-wise before coming over to the Blues. So Good for him. I want to see him with the Blues. It's that simple. I wish he would sign. I wish he would have signed yesterday and said, here I come. I'm glad he's going to get his degree, get that diploma. What's he getting it in? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. Oh, Does it really matter? <laughs> no, probably oh. doesn't. Probably doesn't. He's a pro hockey player. It doesn't matter. Uh, when, he, uh, when his class does graduate that first year out, he'll be making more than any of them. That's my point. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh Schertz, one more game at Indiana State, the future St. Louis U head coach, and his Sycamores knocked off Utah last night in the NIT, or as we call it at our house, the NIT, uh, 100 to 90. And Seton Hall hammered Georgia 84 67, so it'll be. Indiana State and Seton Hall for the NIT title. Did you guys watch it at all? I did. I did not catch I it I love the way night. that uh, oh, Indiana State plays. I hope, they play, I hope the Billikens play that way next year. Offensive efficiency, mm-hmm. uh, the way that he runs this team, and you have to wonder what does he bring to slew with some of the players that are there. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Maybe so. <laughs> I hope so. Is he bringing him over? Yeah. He'll be uh, must-watch TV. He, he, oh, he'll sell tickets. Yes. I will continue to purchase my tickets because Kareem Abdul-Jabbar will be here. Let's be honest. You continue to purchase your tickets anyway because you support true. the program. I do support the program. <laughs> this is true. I support, I support the Lou. Yeah. So, you always have. Yeah. Ticket so. taking all the way to being a season ticket <laughs> holder. Exactly. <laughs> right. And if, if the Billikens get a coach that ha- has like a really complicated and really effective offensive scheme, and you combine that with a bespectacled big man who likes to pass, I, I may shed a tear. Yeah, by the way, if you aren't aware of Kareem Abdul Jabbar, and this is C R E A M, he's mm-hmm. a, a, a big guy, Robbie Avila for Indiana State. He's like 6'10, to, I, I can tell you, 6'10, 260. He's a, he's a big man, but 6'10. Not two, really a basketball body. No, no. Where's the, where's the goggles? Yeah. What do you six, mean, six, Dan? 6'10, t- 240. Not cut up, you yeah. know. Not uh, shredded. But his nickname is Cream Abdul Jabbar because it. he wears the goggles and he's 6'10, 240. Hey, look at DJ Burns. I yeah. mean, maybe the college basketball body is changing a little bit. Here. Maybe. There Big you go, man bro. basketball. Maybe they're getting smart. Maybe they're maybe they're eating some hot dogs. Hot dogs, Krispy Kremes. Yep. That's the spread after games. Yeah, that's what we need. Come and get a few Cokes, maybe some yep. sodas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Cardinals need me as their nutritionist. Oh, <laughs> You'd no. be all over it, Randy. Those, the, the best bakery in town, those Schnooks Donuts waiting for him every morning for a day yeah. game. Oh, oh, oh. First order Cream of business, filled. getting the popcorn back for Nolan Gorman. Oh, yeah. The, uh, popcorn opia from uh, from uh, Costco. Yeah, it's, just, it's like a little... Uh, what do you what do you call the shape that's kind of a round triangle? Uh, it's it's, a, and it's, it's the shape like that's a, a round triangle. It, Maybe it's, it's a triangle. It's a, no, it's, because <laughs> it's it's a cylindrical, but it descends. There is a, a name for that oh, shape. No. Whoa. It's a cone. It's a cone. That's what it is. Uh, it, it, is it, it? It's a plastic cone that they fill up with like really delicious and really decadent popcorn. I've never seen it. Oh yeah. Uh, look up uh, pop. Popcornopolis on the Twitter machine or on the Google machine, Popcorn and uh, you'll see it. Popcornopolis, okay. and you'll see the the packaging. And Brooke, you can tell me whether or not it is indeed a cone that the popcorn is installed in. Okay, this is all right. Do 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 do. Yes, that is a cone. Thank you. 
You guys think I'm dumb. No, I, no we, we don't. don't. <laughs> no. I was just, it, it, you know, this early in the morning I, I, trying to remember I, certain I, shapes. Just a little brain freeze. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say tornado, so that wouldn't have been good. Popcornopolis. Uh, I mean, technically, uh, if you look at it, you're not wrong, Dan. Yeah, he, he talked about the sphere at the top there comes you, down. It's shaped like a tornado. You're 100% right. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, this Popcornopolis, uh, the, their zebra, uh, it's to Norlin Gorman. Go back to this stuff. <laughs> It'll make you hit a few home runs and make contact. Uh, coming up, it's Ask Uncle Randy Day on this Wednesday on 101 ESPN. And we'd love to have you join us. All you need to do is send a text in, and Matthew will uh, find your text. 314-399-9646. 314-399-YO-HO. Don't forget to watch us on the Air Alliance Team Studio Cam either. If you're watching us right now, I'm looking right at you. America, and uh, you can just go to YouTube and type in 101 ESPN STL. We would love to see you on the Air Alliance Team Studio Cam. Love you. And uh, we'll see you with Ask Uncle Randy next on 101 ESPN. Meet Sumner One, your go-to source for all things office technology. We're proud to be one of the largest independently owned providers in the region with 11 strategic locations across five states. At Sumner One, we specialize in workplace solutions, enterprise print, production print, large format solutions, cutting edge document technology, and more. Quality, service, and innovation. That's the Sumner One advantage. Visit us online at SumnerOne.com. That's S-U-M-N-E-R-1.com. Sumner One, welcome to the one place where everything works. In today's fast-paced world of digital marketing, making meaningful connections with your audience can be a daunting challenge for any business. But what if there is a place where connections aren't just made but nurtured for growth? Enter 2060 Digital, our sister company here, backed by a 100-year-old media empire just like 101 ESPN. If you're a business owner or a marketer seeking more strategic ways to reach and engage customers, look no further than 2060 Digital. With 12 years of expertise, 2060 specializes in simplifying the complexities of digital marketing. Our team demystifies the process by transforming it from a challenge into an opportunity for your business. Whether it's enhancing your brand's online presence, optimizing digital campaigns, or increasing customer engagement, 2060 is here to propel your business forward. Think your business has room to grow? Let us prove it to you. Visit 101ESPN.com slash 2060digital to request a complimentary digital audit today from 2060digital. Save big money on everything for your bathroom project at Menards. Upgrade your bathroom with Max. With more than 1,000 shower doors, bathtubs, and shower kits, you're sure to find exactly what you need to add style and luxury to your bathroom. Plus, we have all the stylish faucets and bath hardware to finish your project. Check out our entire selection of Max bathroom products and our weekly flyer today on Menards.com. Save big money at Menards.
question for Uncle Randy? Let him dive into his infinite well filled with wisdom to find you answers. Text 314-399-9646. It's Ask Uncle Randy on 101 ESPN. It's going to be a cold opening day in St. Louis. The the blustery winds of St. Louis wafting over the Bush Stadium turf on opening day for the home opener tomorrow. But now we're into the spring. You sound like NFL films right there, Randy. The frozen tundra of Green Bay and Lambeau Field. Yeah, there we go. Aaron Rodgers requested another trade. (laughs) (laughs) If you have a question for me or Dan or Brooke, it's Ask Uncle Randy Day here on 101 ESPN. And Matthew has our texts. Matthew, what do you have for us? Dear Uncle Randy, do you feel as if right now is a good time to buy or sell my new house? I do not need a new house, but there's a few things about my house that no longer work. I don't like them anymore. Namely, we have another kid on the way and the space is starting to run out. But I don't know. I'm getting, starting to get a little worried about the rates. Uh, well, here's the thing that you should do is just call my friend Gloria Lou. Just go to GloriaHasTheBuyers.com and she will get you the most for your home. You aren't going to be in a situation as a young parent where you're going to want to downsize. You're going to want to upsize. And here's one thing about the rates. The rates have caused demand to drop and prices to drop. So it winds up being a wash, actually. You used to have the high rates, uh, the low rates and the high prices for homes. Now you have the higher rates and the lower prices for homes. So it's six to one half dozen of the other. And once with the lower price of your home, the rates are going to go back down. So you just refi. But with Gloria Lou. Well, you you can refi with (laughs) With, the the bagel loan. Well, obviously, the bagel loan is number one. But (laughs) Gloria Lou is where you sell. That's our realtor where you sell. Sure. So, yeah, so we've got a lot of plans for you here. GloriaHasTheBuyers.com. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, Uncle Randy would say, knowing what I know, that, yes, you're go- ultimately going to have to upsize, okay? Do it now. Do it now. And, by the way, Gloria can find a buyer for you, even if your home needs repairs. So I would suggest that you play that card ASAP. I get it. The interest rates are high right now, mm-hmm. and we've been looking at some homes. We got our house in 2020. That's when the interest rates were great, mm-hmm. and it's kind of hard to part with your house when the interest rates were so good at that time. Because right now, I think they're bad. I think it's 8.5. Don't yeah, you listen okay. to Stewie? Of course I listen the to Stewie. Loan. The bagel I love loan. the bagel loan. You know, he Stewie's will, always there. If I give you that number, he will pick up the phone. It's his personal cell phone, and you can text him right now. So if you want your phone... Uh, in your hands and you wanted to text or call Stewie, he's going to, from Stewart's American Mortgage, he's going to pick up the phone and help you out, Brooke. I'm going to call Stewie. I like Stewie a lot. I told you, I, I think that he is fantastic. Oh, he is. He does. He helps a lot of ESPN listeners. He does. He's got a clean live read game. Uncle Randy, I got a, in a huge argument with the wife going right now. Is cheerleading a sport? <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> oh, did you even hear the rest of the question? <laughs> I'm not sure we need to. He's a huge argument yeah. going with the wife right now. Is cheerleading a sport? Cheerleading is 100% absolutely a sport. Yeah. It is. They're great athletes. They compete just like competition for uh, gymnastics or just like competition for uh, ice skating. And the athleticism that cheerleaders display is 100% authentic and real. Yes, cheerleading is indeed a sport. It really is. I, and I'm just going to take a wild guess here. And com- this texter can tell me if I'm completely wrong. I'm guessing she's saying it is a sport and mm-hmm. he's saying that it's not. Yeah. It is 100% a sport. There's gymnastics involved. There's tumbling. I did cheerleading just for a little bit in middle school and then going into high school. Mm -hmm. I kid you not, that was probably the most, which sounds weird for me to say about my middle school self, probably Mm -hmm. the most ripped I ever was. Really? Wow. (laughs) Because we, and it's also what trained me properly in the weight room, because you had to do a lot of that just so that you could do a lot of the heavy lifting. It is 100% a sport. Yeah. So is dancing. The, no the girls doubt. that dance. Yep. And I guess, do some of the guys dance too? Oh, yeah. I know guys are in the cheerleading thing, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's a sport. It's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. No, when people are, you know, we when I was at Parkway North, we had the Vikettes, and the Vikettes were always, and the, the cheerleaders, they were all in 
sensational condition. You, it, it is an athletic endeavor, and it is a sport, no doubt about it. Dear Uncle Randy, my daughter and I went to the zoo with a friend and his girlfriend and baby, and we've been friends since fifth grade. We're both 31 now, mm -hmm. and they both make good money, and they don't. I don't make a bunch myself, and he told my daughter to go pick out a toy, and he would buy it. I know it wasn't malicious at all, but I feel weird about it. Should I? What should I think about it? Any tips to get over it? There's no need to get over your friend, your childhood friend, buying your kid a present. There's no reason to worry about that. It wasn't malicious. It was a kind gesture on the part of a giving person. I would do the same thing. I, I, I try to be generous. It, it was just a kind gesture on the part of a generous person. Don't look at it any other way. I agree with you. I think that that's the right thing to do there. I think it was just a very nice gesture. Yeah. So, and you went to a free zoo. So, mm. if it was the St. Louis Zoo, so it's pretty cool. And you always bring in carrot cakes that cost you money. Well, I try to be kind and generous and giving. Yeah. I, and you do too. You bring in donuts all the time. Yeah. We, we all, in our own way, are giving people here, and I, I, I admire that. I, I, again, if I were at the zoo in this in the same situation, and a kid was fired up about the, the little store over there, whatever whatever the store, yeah, go go pick something out. Go pick something out. Yeah, no well, because deal. here's the thing. If you tell your own kids, go in, then the other kid feels left out. So you tell all the kids, go in and pick something out, Tommy. What about shoplifting? Well, that's probably uh, not something okay. that you want to... The five-finger discount? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. that, that's not something that... Because that's a gateway, Dan. Okay. When we advocate for shoplifting at the zoo, then all of a sudden... You know, can't do that. No, you, you, you then you're robbing Brinks trucks five years later. Uh, Matthew <laughs> went from the zoo to Brinks trucks. Uh, well, I'm just gonna say let's let's pour one out for six one eight. He's about to have a rough week. It's like the like the movie The Town. You know that's th those kids started out by shoplifting at the zoo. <laughs> Wait, can I say can I say one little thing? Sorry, I got distracted by this follow up because we're getting some texts in about the cheerleading thing. So he followed up and said, "Correct, my wife was a cheerleader. I kind of thought I'd lose this argument. Thank you." And then he said, "My argument was it was a competition, not a sport. There's no ball. Swimming's a sport." Yep. I would Good say point. swimming is There's, a sport. Track and field is a sport. Yeah. I mean, yeah. running is a sport. I, I, I mean, competitive running is a sport. Is, I can't. Yeah, you kidding is me? Is hockey a sport? Yeah. It a, is. Yeah. No ball. No ball. Somebody else right. said it's not, a, it's not a sport unless there's an offense and a defense. I would tend to disagree with that. Or like offensive and defensive like parts. Yeah. No. It's uh, like there's no defense in golf, is there? Not really, no, but the golf's course pretty hard the sport. Defense, the course I guess, is and you're the I guess. offense, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's just physics is your is the defense, yeah, I guess. I, I, I think we all, I guess, have our own definitions, but I look at it as a competition that requires athletic prowess. And now I know you're going to get, well, race car, race car driving. You know, try driving a race car at 180 miles an hour. You'll pass and out. tell me how uh, your uh, your hand-eye coordination is. Oh, yeah. You were over at the raceway yesterday, right? I was, yeah. Getting ready for NASCAR, June 2nd, over at uh, uh, Worldwide it. Technology Raceway. It's going to be fun. I think the average person would pass out from the, from the, the, the G-Force. Yeah. You probably just slowly kind of, I mean, not like a, a plane is quickly, but I think over time you probably just slowly lose yeah. your breath. Uh, Dear Uncle Randy, our team starts men's league playoffs this week. Winner goes to Toronto for nationals. This is uh, hockey, I assume? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, our worst player has been playing worse, even worse lately, and he's also been running his mouth in the group chat. Do we bench him during the playoffs as he's cost us games already? Yes. Absolutely. You do. Uh, now, it is a team sport, and you might need him sometimes, so you're going to have to, as a leader of this squad, I presume, because you are texting in to ask Uncle Randy, you're going to have to keep his spirits up. You're going to have to tell him, hey, you're good, you're good you're good make him believe something that's not true but uh, if he's talking up a storm don't bench him maliciously bench him because he's not a good player okay just the best players got to play but again if maybe he's financing the trip to toronto i don't know but uh, <laughs> get him get him so on the ice roll yeah right. <laughs> main, main financer to take you guys but let it let him play because you know what you aren't winning any stanley cups for this this is a th th this is a bonding adventure men's league hockey sure you want to win but at the end of the day it's not like you're getting a hundred and fifty thousand dollar playoff bonus if you do so let everybody play make it more like third grade than men's league i hope he's not the goalie oh yeah right <laughs> you gotta go to him with ryan reeves stats and be like listen here look at this yep. 69 regular season games played yeah. one playoff game played it just sometimes you gotta shorten the bench a little yep. bit it happens here's the thing brooke dan whenever a player retires what do they say they miss most 
The camaraderie. Camaraderie. Mm-hmm. So make it about camaraderie. Don't make it about trying to win a men's league thing. And you know what? You're going to Toronto from St. Louis in a men's league. You are winning. So <laughs> that's a really Randy. good point. That's a, that's a yeah. really good point. They're going to Toronto, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> Those guys play they are juniors. Winning. Those guys play juniors. Yeah. So <laughs> what if you gave them a specialized role? Say, hey, we're we're advancing. You know, we're we're have a chance at a championship. We're you know the ice time may be cut a little bit, but we love you in this particular role, and that's where we want you, you to go. You, absolutely. You, whoever the coach is, or whoever the leader of the team is, you're from St. Louis, okay? Yeah, well, you go to him and say, hey, Robert Bortuzzo was a key part of the Blues in 2019. There you go. <laughs> you Specialized role. Yep. <laughs> uh, dear, uh, dear Uncle Second Alert Randy, how do I dress for this weather? One day it's shorts, <laughs> then it's a Parker, then Jamie's in a Speedo. How do I plan on what to wear each day? Welcome to St. Louis. I wore a warm pullover today. I'm wearing a yep. gray Spidey pullover, spider, and it's super warm. Oh, but I'm doing it because I know we're going to have an eye of 50 or something today. I don't know how the hell to dress for the weather in St. Louis. <laughs> but what I do is I wear a shirt that... I can take the pullover off, and the shirt is still presentable. We're about to get to that time of the year, too. And this is looking ahead, second Mm -hmm. alert weather advice here on how to dress, Mm -hmm. where during the early portion of the day, you need a jacket, you might need to bundle up a little bit, and all of a sudden it will heat up later on in the afternoon. So we're getting close to that. But when I stepped out today, I didn't know how to dress. And so I have a short sleeve top, and then I have my big jacket. And then it was so windy. I don't know. Do you is this scarf needed? You think tomorrow or parka? What what are we what are uh, we doing here? WWMD. What would Mo do? He'll have a scarf. Oh, yeah, is scarf. he in his scarf era still? Oh yeah, I think so. Because sure. he's had different eras. He's had the puffer vest era. Of uh-huh. course, we remember when he uh-huh. had the shirt over the shoulders. Or yep. what, what do you he call that? Florida. Oh, that's more of a Florida look. Yeah. And then we've had bow tie. He doesn't wear the bow tie as much anymore. No, he doesn't wear a tie as much. I anymore. wonder why. But tomorrow opening day. That was an ode to his grandfather. Was it really? Was it yeah. really? Yeah. Now I feel bad. I like the now bow ties, really bad honestly. I do too. <laughs> I could never tie a bow tie, though. Never. They're, they're I would true. have a clip on. They're impossible. Yeah, that's, Is that cheating, technically? How do, I know that some people have feelings about that. Does it matter? I don't if, care if I'm if, cheating on that. If, if nobody can tell. <laughs> there's no way I can tie a bow tie. It's not 1914. Yeah. Yeah. Know how to tie a regular tie. Get the clip on for the bow oh, tie. Oh, no. Don't, just go, go, go okay Philip Rivers. Just don't go, go full clip Just on. go bolo. No. Uh, well, yeah, do that. Yeah. yeah. Got one more? Yeah. She, like I said, pour one out for 618 because he's texting this in right now. Uncle Randy, my 44th anniversary is tomorrow. What should I get her? Oh, 44th anniversary is tomorrow. Tomorrow? Congratulations. Uh. What should I get her? Still tickets available for, available for opening day. So kidnap her and take her to opening day. <laughs> kidnap her? Yeah, from work or whatever and say, hey, we're Randy. going to opening. Like a romantic kidnapping. It's a romantic 40, kidnapping? So, what so is you that? Are, you know what? You're probably, um, you're, you're probably <laughs> retired or close to retired. She can probably get out of any work that she has to do. So, yeah, get together. Come on down to Ballpark Village. Have a, a bite there and head to opening day and then take her out for a really nice dinner afterward. And you, this is in the 618? Yeah. Uh, what's the place with the two-pound carrot cake? I can't remember, but I just think about two-pound carrot cake. Yeah. Text, text line, uh, it, 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 it's not Tucker's, is it? Oh, it might be Tucker's. So, carrot cake. Uh, we need your help. Uh, text line, Clabe's two-pound two carrot cake. You know, nothing says being a romantic than two-pound carrot cake. Yes. bringing your significant other down to Ballpark Village while we're broadcasting live from 7 to 10. Oh, yeah, there you go. There's the place. 7, 7 to, 11. to 11. 7 to 11. Right. Team, you, team Max on vacay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The only negative here is that Kyle Gibson is not pitching for your 44th anniversary. <laughs> oh, good point. That's the only <laughs> right. Maybe you can meet Jason Isringhausen. Oh, there we go. Izzy's listening. Izzy, uh, text us. And uh, tell us if you'll come over. We can set something up. Yeah, 44th. We can get Izzy to come on over, can't we? The Red Jacket, he'll be there. He'll be there for sure. Yeah. Red so, Jacket, all the Cardinal Hall of Famers will be there. Yeah, looking forward. Big Mac will be in town. I always love to uh, see our buddy, the Big Redhead. How about uh, 618 says Porter's in Collinsville. Porter's in Collinsville. Uh, Thank you very there much. There we go. Two pound carrot cake. So, yeah, 618, take her there for dinner. There Great we go. idea. Well done. Uh, we've got ideas for you because we are Uncle Randy. Thanks so much for your texts. We do appreciate them. <laughs> you are Uncle Randy. We well, Uncle we, we, Randy. we as a team provide great advice. I'm Uncle Randy, yes, but it's, I couldn't do it without you guys. I feel, like, I feel like we should have all said that at once together, and it was okay, so weird. One, two, three. We, we are, are Uncle, Uncle Randy. Randy. I said you. <laughs> you you are, okay. That sounded like 65% like a cult. We just summoned something. I don't know what. But. We get a lot of those in America right now. Because that's kind of your alter ego. 
because oh. this one was very. I, I, it was mild just very matter of fact. Yeah, it was very mild. Yeah. Well, it, but I, I spoke from the heart. Daniel. Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love the zoo one though. Free zoo. Uh, we need a free agent, free zoo. Hey, the Cardinal defense has been great so far. We'll tell you why next on 101 ESPN. Together Credit Union, City SC's official banking partner, is offering you a safe and reliable way to grow your hard-earned money. Certificates of deposit, or CDs, are an attractive investment for new and experienced investors because the return on your investment is fixed and guaranteed. Right now, Together Credit Union is offering two fantastic CD promotions. Your first CD rate option is an 11-month CD term with a 5.40 annual percentage yield. Your second CD rate option is a 19-month CD term with a 5.00 annual percentage yield. Both options require a minimum balance of $1,000. All you need to do is go to your nearest Together Credit Union branch or visit togethercu.org today to learn more. Early withdrawal penalties apply and may reduce earnings on the account. Rate offers are accurate as of January 18th respectively and rates are subject to change without notice. Other rates and terms available. Membership eligibility required. Federally insured by the NCUA. And don't forget about that Together Credit Union City SC debit card that'll get you in the game easy. It's really efficient and it's awesome to check out at Together Credit Union. This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals with another win over the Padres yesterday, this time 5 to 2. They'll go for game 3 and the sweep tonight against the Padres. Earlier game 310 first pitch. It'll be Zach Thompson 0 1 on the season with an 844 ERA, facing off against Joe Musgrove 0 1 on the season with a 972 ERA. Also, the Blues back in action tomorrow down at Enterprise Center. You can catch the game right here on 101 ESPN, your home for the St. Louis Blues. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads up 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me?
The Cardinals have played six games. They are three and three, and the Cardinals are just one of three teams of the 30 in MLB to not commit an error yet, and they're tied for second in MLB with eight double plays. Wynn and Gorman looking great at the Keystone combo, and Wynn is batting 313. Gorman's at 217, but defensively, the Cardinals have looked great. And I've always thought with the athleticism of Jordan Walker that he would become a, a good defensive player. And the catch the other night was spectacular, but he has not made any mistakes yet in the outfield. I, I, I find it strange that people define players based upon their first couple of months of playing in the majors or playing a position without the idea that a player can get better. He's gotten a lot better. Obviously, Victor Scott is a stud defensively. The Cardinals, they're, they're infield defensively. Arnado is playing really well again defensively. Mason Wynn, I always said, Dan, and I think we agree on this, he had kind of a Trey Turner skill set. I think he's got a better arm than Turner. And oh, then, yeah. then Goldie can still play first. And Gorman has been fine so far at second base. And you could put Donovan there, too, yep. or maybe even Tommy Edmond. I look at this uh, defensively stability with the injuries um even with the injuries that they've had they've been able to roll out basically the same lineup every single night i think that's a key so guys have defined roles and where they want to go you mentioned jordan walker i love win and his athleticism and Contreras. you know again i mentioned it earlier but he's stealing strikes so he's been better behind the plate Airs can be a, a little misleading because a lot of it is dictated on your range. Mm -hmm. If you can get to a ball and if it touches your glove, all of a sudden you're uh, charged with an air. But I look at the range of this team as much better than it was a year ago. A lot of that has to do with Victor Scott in center. Mm -hmm. I think you look at Jordan Walker making his strides and also Wynn. Wynn has got really good range at short. So it's not the airs to me. It's more about the range and them getting to some of these baseballs. They look a lot better defensively for all the things that you listed out there and I really enjoy having Victor Scott the second as your center fielder now last night for those who are looking for an update on the injury front Lars Newtbar there was some confusion because at first they put out that he would be in center field he actually was in left field for the Redbirds he went over three with an RBI and a run scored now he should be able to come back here soon I think he will be at Bush Stadium according to reports I don't think that he might not be playing in that game but I think that he will be around for some of the festivities but either way he's coming off the injured list I believe he's available as soon as Thursday so when he comes back how does this really move things around because I'm in the camp of you need to keep Victor Scott the second here for all the many different reasons that we listed I'm guessing that Michael Ciani is the odd man out mm -hmm. here I thought that he's been actually great pretty much for them I know that the bats not there but still, defensively, I've liked what you've seen. And he had a great catch as well. We talked about Jordan Walker the game before, but he had a great catch last night. Another thing that I notice is Miles Michaelis looks so much more at ease with the guys behind him. Didn't you notice that? There was times that he was smiling when a catch mm -hmm. was made, play was made. You could really tell that he was a lot more at ease. And that's what happens when you have a better sound team defensively. Right. To, the, to your point about who goes down, it's clearly Siani. Uh, they don't need defensive replacements on this team. So I, I would think that he's not coming off the bench to hit. So I would think that he'll be the odd man out. The interesting thing will be what happens with the lineup. And I wonder if they bring Donovan into play second. That's Move where I'm Gorman going. Gorman over mm -hmm. to DH. And yep. then when Newbar is ready to play every day, you play him and left. And then that's just bad news for Burleson and Matt Carpenter. Yeah, I would think then you have the role for Matt Carpenter, which he's been thrust into being a DH and pinch hitting. And I would say that that's going to be reduced, although he's been fine so far. You look at Carpenter, he is three for 10. Take that all, all day. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a slightly a pinch hitter dh whatever you want to say and then burleson does become your primary dh and now you have the look of the team that you thought outside of victor scott in center mm -hmm. because you thought you'd have tommy edmund but victor scott has played his way to providing excitement uh great defense and when he gets on the bases he disrupts but to to clarify here if if new bars playing left and Donovan's playing center, then Gorman has to be your DH, right? I meant second. I meant Donovan oh. at second base. Okay. Yeah. Did I say that? Yeah, Did Donovan I say center? Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. And so Burleson is kind of the odd man out yes. there. Yes. Yes. So that so we're we, we just put it together. Thank you're welcome, Ollie. 
I think that might be the way he goes. <laughs> yeah. Although it, 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 one of the things that they're going to look at is what's going to keep Victor Scott in the lineup is that he's got to get on base and he only has three hits. He's yeah. three for 22. He's batting 136. Now, when he gets a hit, it's exciting or he draws a walk. It's exciting, but that's what's going to keep him in the lineup. And, they, they, you know, they know the defense, but he's going to have to get on base to make sure that he stays here. Guys, I want to go back to the defense for a moment because it's super early. We've only played six games. The Royals and Diamondbacks are already, they already have eight defensive runs saved each. The Cardinals are 20th, and things are going to change over the course of a week. They change dramatically, and especially once you get New Bar back. Uh, but right now, the Cardinals are minus one. They're 20th in Major League Baseball in defensive runs saved, 17th in outs above average. But that can change a lot with one player, one player. If Donovan all of a sudden is at second base, then all of a sudden your defensive run saved. All due respect to what, the way Nolan Gorman has played, but Donovan has more range. And Newt Barr in left is going to enhance your left field defense too. Nolan Gorman with the day off last night. So do you think that he will just be your DH moving forward for the majority of the time? They don't want to pigeonhole him. I, I would guess that he'll get time. I don't know how much, but he'll get time at second base. Because Injuries will dictate yeah. that, too. Yeah, I was just going to say he has improved defensively. I've been impressed by him this season. I, I was impressed by him two years ago when he came up. I mean, you're asking a guy that's been a third baseman his entire life, mm -hmm. essentially, to move to second base. Completely different position, trying to turn double plays, ranging to your left, ranging up the middle with a backhanded play. It's not easy. I think he's a little bit above average, and maybe I'm in the minority on this, but I do think he's better than people think. And he needs 500 at-bats. Yeah, he, find him somewhere, yeah. With, the, with that player, you need to get him at-bats because if you give him 500 at-bats, he's going to hit 35 to 40 out of the ballpark. I would think so, too. Yep. That's Dan. That's Brooke. I'm Randy. Coming up, we've got Take It or Leave It. Get your text into the Air Comfort Service text line, 314-399-9646, 314-399-YOHO. YOHO. Teoli oh, is next on 101 ES. Right on it. Hey everyone, it's Brooke here for Universal Windows Direct. As you know, the weather is just all over the place. We were talking about this morning, it's super windy, it's going to be chilly at times, and then it'll be warming up later in the day. But where you shouldn't be feeling all those temperature changes is inside your home. So you should call my guys over at Universal Windows Direct to avoid all those crazy temperature changes. And you may be wondering, can windows really make that big of a difference? Here's the thing they can, and here's how. Their windows feature super spacer technology, which helps keep the edge of the glass warm 
warmer, holds the window seal longer, and makes your windows last up to five times longer than other window systems. So your windows from Universal perform better and they last longer. Call Universal Windows Direct today at 314-334-2522 for your free in-home estimate. And for every two windows you buy, you get two for free. Buy two, get two. Buy four, get four. There's really no limit to what you can do there. Plus, they'll upgrade your new windows to triple pane glass for free, and they'll double your energy tax credit restrictions apply. Tell them I told you to call, and you can also get a $250 off your next project for the last windows you'll ever need. Go to UniversalWindowsDirect.com, and like me, you'll be saying, I love my windows. And give us your take it or leave it. Brought to you by Gloria Lou Realty. Visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com and start packing. That's my final offer. Take it or leave it. We welcome your text 314-399-9646-314-399. Yo ho! Kids, yesterday in Kansas City, they held a vote to extend an already in place three eighths of a cent sales tax. So for every hundred dollars you would spend, thirty-eight cents would go towards building stadiums or maintaining stadiums in Kansas City. And this vote in Kansas City and Jackson County lost. It was rejected. It would have helped build a new stadium for the Royals in downtown KC and provide upgrades to the three-time Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs. Take it or leave it, this is a wake-up call for pro sports teams that the Chiefs can lose a vote. That, by the way, they had Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey stumping for. Mm. Ooh. Take that for sure. I'll take it. And you have Bobby Witt that was just signed. Mm-hmm. So you have the face of the franchise. Um, yeah, I, I think that if you don't get this three time Super Bowl champion and you don't get with Bobby Witt and the money that they spent in the offseason and a owner that by all the, I read an article on the Kansas City owner. Sherman. This bat, yeah, that they he's everything and then some that they thought he might be. You're not going to get it done. No. And it, it again. We offered almost a half a billion dollars to build an NFL stadium. And the NFL decided, you know what? We don't need your money. We'll go build a privately financed stadium in Los Angeles and we'll pay for all of it. To me, the NFL specifically told cities then that day, they don't need your money. We're good. We can just go build our own. Once they did that, then no. No NFL team should get public money. I know that Nashville provided public money for their stadium. Buffalo did. They took money out of their education budget in New York State (laughs) to provide money for the Bills' new stadium. But with the money that these guys have now and the the value of their franchises, there's no good reason for the public to build NFL stadiums. Well, and you're talking about Nissan Stadium. That is a $2 billion project, and you're already having a lot of pushback because it falls a lot on the taxpayers, and so you already have an entertainment tax that you're dealing with in Nashville, and on top of that, now you're going to have that added to it, so there is a lot of pushback in the public, even though you do have a lot of revenue coming in for tourism, all the different kind of stuff. It's still a lot of money to put on the taxpayers who are already paying a lot of money in general with everything that you have with living wise especially if you live in nashville it's extremely expensive to add another tax on top of that is is tough should we just look at this as just being another business and so don't look at it as sports just look at it as business x i think that's the way to do it yeah look at it logically and oh by the way I know what's going to happen here. I know that the government is going to override what the public wants because this happens in Missouri. But I I hate the fact that, and it's happened on more than one occasion with non-sports things. I hate the fact that the legislature can say, yeah, the public voted it down, but we'll change it. We'll take care of you. They do it, and they probably will.
Take it or leave it. I thought this was really interesting. Jeff Jones of the Belleville News Democrat. He tweeted this out. This is something I haven't seen before at games, but I think it's something that we'll start to see. It was a warning that the Padres had put out for all the fans. It says the Padres have a zero tolerance policy regarding offensive, derogatory, or betting related language or harassment of our employees, players, umpires, and other fans. Any violation of this policy will be subject to discipline. Take it or leave it. We're going to start seeing more of that specific language and warning at more and more games, especially the betting. I've never thought about that before. I'm going to take that. I I was reading a story the other day, to your point, Brooke, where there was, might have been Jason Tatum. Yep, that's who it was. And he said that somebody, I'm paraphrasing, but somebody was behind the bench and said, well, you cost me in the second Mm -hmm. half by scoring X amount of points or whatever it was, but it was betting related for the player. Yeah. Did Jeff say, did you get kicked out of the game if... I it says if any can... violation of this policy will be subject to discipline. So I'm wow. sure maybe that's wow. a possibility. That's robbery. You ready for my take it or leave it? <laughs> I, I, I caught it. That's why I'm just moving right on. Take it or leave it. Going into yesterday's action around Major League Baseball. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> You certainly do. Uh, Home teams had a 377 winning percentage. So early trend, that's one of the most surprising trends of the season. Home teams only a 377 winning percentage. That's shocking. Yeah. I I, I was trying to think of reasons why is it weather related in terms of some of these home teams where it's kind of a crapshoot when you get Mm -hmm. in these cold games. They seem to be different than others. I, I just wonder if that's part of it or if it's better pitching staffs with the visiting teams coming in. Seems like pitching is ahead of hitting. Mm-hmm. These are all things that could be factors yeah, as to why this happens. Really surprising. Yeah, it really is. So, I, And it'll be interesting, obviously, small sample size. It'll be interesting to look at that set again after a month. I, that's where I'm <laughs> yes. going. Yeah. It'll totally flip. But yeah. I just thought it was an interesting early trend. Yeah. All right, uh, Matthew, what do we got on the text line? Matthew's enjoying this for some reason. Take, I'm, just, I'm, re- I'm reading through the take it or leave it. Yeah. Take it or leave it. The Cardinals are in first place in the Central before the end of April. I'm going to leave that yeah, because of the schedule that they have. It's yeah. it's a gauntlet of a schedule now. If you said May 31st, then I think we have a conversation. I, I just I look at it this year. If they can keep their head above water in this first month, hang around 500, game or two above, below, no reason to think that they couldn't take off. Well, yeah, they could take off, but. Pittsburgh's going 162 and 0. They're awesome right now. They, they are. are. 2024 the World Champion table. Pirates. Maybe so. And this is going to be after they trade half their team. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Take it or leave it. Dylan Carlson is basically JD Drew. Shows flashes, but he's always injured. Um, I'm going to leave that because I don't think he's as good as JD Drew was. 100% agree. I'm leave it. JD Drew is a fantastic baseball player if you could keep him on the field mm-hmm. and if he was motivated to be the player that he could be. Scouts will still tell you, even 25, almost 30 years later, that JD Drew was the best college position player they ever saw. Do you look back at that and still in amazement that he went to the independent league and bypassed millions of dollars to go play independent baseball? It's amazing. And by the way, that's one guy that Boris did make work for. When he got the contract from Boston after opting out with the Dodgers, he was made completely good. And uh, I I think, doesn't J.D. fly planes now and stuff? Yeah, Yeah. it's something like that. Does he really? Yeah. So he's, he's got it going pretty good. The other guy that it worked out for and he used college as leverage was Ricky and Keel. Right. Yeah. Ricky and Keel was within 24 hours of enrolling. I think it was at Miami or Florida State, but he was going to play college baseball, and that's how they used it as leverage to make sure he got signed at the number that they wanted. I remember when they uh, drafted and Keel. Was, it, was that the same year they drafted Drew? That was 98, yeah. I think so. Uh, whoever it was, the first round pick, I was talking to Walt about the first round pick, and he said, hey, Keep an eye on this Richard Ankiel that we got in the second round. Yeah. He's going to be something. And sure enough, man, he probably would you, for me, it's the best curveball I've ever seen. Yes. Rick, Rick Ankiel's curveball in his rookie year was the best I've ever seen. Uh, I would put it up there for sure. Daryl Kyles was really yeah, good. That was really good. That was really good. Yeah. But the, you could actually, I'd be down on the field watching him play catch. You could hear the zzz like yeah. that on the <laughs> curveball. Yep. It was unbelievable how he snapped that off. It had a nickname, the Snapdragon. Exactly. And he was drafted in 97. 97, okay. Uh, take your leave. The players who play the same position exceeding expect with players, excuse me, with players who play the same position exceeding expectations, the Cardinals are going to start trading some people. I'm going to leave that. 
I don't think that that's the direction that they'll go in just yet. Now, you get towards a trade deadline and you have a deficiency with one of the team's areas, then I could see potentially an outfielder. Um, if they need more pitching, I could see them doing that. But you have to stay healthy. Well, and you can't have enough guys that can play these positions. And the thing is, teams just don't make trades before the deadline anymore. No. It comes down to the deadline. Yeah. It's, you, you can have an extra guy, but if you want a pitcher, I, I think in each of the last two years, there has not been a starting pitcher traded before a week before the trade deadline. P pitchers do not get traded in April, May, or June. It's not until the end of July. And the reason for that is with the wild card. You, you still feel you have a chance. There's always mm -hmm. like 10 teams, 11 teams that have a chance to get the second wild card. And that's what makes teams, organizations, hold on to their pitching. Yep. This is a mean one from John, but I'm going to read it anyway. Like it. Take it or leave it. With the KC voters giving a resounding no, we'll soon be talking about the OKC Royals and the San Antonio Chiefs. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll take it. That's I'm going to have to leave it, but it's funny. Yeah. I'm going to take that it's funny. I wonder if they go to Kansas. <laughs> I wonder if they just uh, cross the border over into Kansas and if Kansas anties up to bring the teams over there. Hasn't that been the rumor for a while? Yeah. Remember the Cardinals were talking about going across the river yeah, with their Dupo. new stadium? Dupo, yeah. 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 That was, was something that was threat. there. And then the Cardinals wound up building their own stadium. You know, the, 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 the thing was, they, they got their bluff called. And thank goodness, the Cardinals, they're, they're one of the few entities that really does build and care about downtown St. Louis. Man, you're right. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. uh, what else would you have? Nothing. Well, you'd have Enterprise Center. You have that, and then the new soccer yeah. stadium, and... But if you didn't have that, along with Ballpark Village, yeah. the actual Bush Stadium, oof, yeah, would be rough. rough. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Did Randy. you have one more you wanted to do? Uh, yeah, just, this is just a quick little like opinion one. Take it or leave it. Frank's Reds, your Frank's hot sauce does not belong in the refrigerator. Frank's hot sauce doesn't belong in the refrigerator. Well, yeah, but I also have a lot of hot sauces in my refrigerator. I have none. You have all, none? I got them all, all, the, all in the cabinet. I've never yeah. had hot sauce. What? what? Never had it. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. Is stunned. Whoa, 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 whoa. Never had hot sauce. Never had a tomato. What? Now, I like ketchup. I just haven't mm -hmm. eaten a I'm tomato. Sorry. Quick question. Hold, hold, like, you've never had nachos or a taco that's had Correct. tomato on it? You've never had pico de gallo in your life? Correct. Pico de gallo. Is, is there a reason? Is there a dietary is, what restriction is going on? Right now? No. no? I'm just, maybe I'm sheltered. <laughs> what about, like, Taco Bell mild sauce? No. Nope. Really? No. What? Never had bruschetta. Okay. No. He just said he hasn't had a tomato. I, 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 I got to go through everything tomato based before I can accept that as an no answer. No tomatoes. Now, sometimes there's chunky tomatoes, I guess, in a sauce, Salsa. like uh, on pasta. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. I, I usually take out the tomatoes. Oh, interesting. Now, one thing I do, I will not put hot sauce on scrambled eggs by themselves, but I can't have uh, an egg breakfast burrito without uh, uh, sauce, salsa, or something like that. Oh, I put hot sauce on just about everything savory. It's going if it's savory, really? it's going on there. We have <laughs> at, at home we have truffle, which is another great hot sauce. Cholula, also sriracha. I have every. Oh. It's going on. So you kids today, you food. love the hot sauce. Brooke, are you saying you put that bleep on everything? I do. I was gonna say that, but Carrot then cake? I was worried. <laughs> See, I, I love like I put that on everything. Chicken wings, but like the the hot really. I need to have a mild. Or need to have it just a rub on it because it my lips start burning and I don't like it. Yeah, my oh, taste buds have died it. over Oof. the years as you get older. I think that's what happens. And so I'm much more accepting of hot sauce now than I used to be. Mm -hmm. so. I love hot Danny, sauce. in the last six months, have you eaten a piece of pizza and gone, oh, that's too spicy? Uh, no, not spicy, but okay. I don't eat the uh, margarita pizza. I didn't think I, I, oh I, I, I didn't think I, yeah, yeah, that was one thing tomatoes. I realized. I'm like, he's never had a margarita pizza. I, I was going to ask that question. I go, he's never had that either. Oh, That's I'm flabbergasted right now. On ESPN. <laughs> coming up a minute. today's fresh take. What does Victor Scott have to do to stay? That's coming your way on 101 ESPN.
All right, let's talk about the best way to watch Cardinals baseball, and that's with your underdog fantasy app pulled up so you can get some live entries going with their Pick'em product. Like right now, active in Missouri, it's Pick'em Champions. You just pick two to five players from at least two different teams, select higher or lower on the player stats. You select your entry fee, you're entered into a game alongside other underdogs, but don't worry, as long as you hit your entries, you're going to be walking away with your money, and the best part about underdog is you get as much as 20x your entry fee, depending on what your entries are. We're going to go with a little bit of a lower one. We're going with about 10x on our entry fee today. We're going to go lower than 15 and a half pitching outs for Zach Thompson. This means he's going to go less than five and a third. Nolan Gorman, higher than 0.5 total bases. Joe Musgrove for the San Diego Padres. We're going to go lower than 17 and a half pitching outs, so just under six innings or just under seven innings there. Jordan Walker, higher than one and a half hits, runs, or RBIs combined. So a little bit of Cardinals offense jumping out there to get us a win on our entry today. That's my favorite thing about underdog. I can always play when the Cardinals are playing. Also, tomorrow, that's going to be the Blues and the Cardinals at the same time. You can combine those two into the same entry on underdog fantasy it's super easy to play and even easier to get started you just go to their easy to use mobile app or to underdogfantasy.com sign up with promo code rocc and underdog will match your first deposit up to hundred dollars plus they'll give you a mystery special pick to use on your first pick of entry that's underdog fantasy promo code rocc to get your first deposit of ten dollars more up to hundred dollars match plus that special picks must be 18 plus and present to stay where underdog fantasy operates terms apply concern you play coin or game over visit www.ncbgambling.org on the day's top stories. It's the opening drive's fresh take. Among others. Smoke toward right center. Get down ball. It is down. Tatis a good job to cut it off. Victor on his way to second. The throw is late. Hustle double Victor Scott. Victor Scott last night was able to get a run for the Cardinals. And you look at his numbers early on, and we all have to keep in mind that it's the first week of the season. (laughs) And we have to keep in mind that Victor Scott is a rookie that is playing his first professional baseball above double A. So after six games, am I worried about a 136 batting average? No. 208 on base? No. Because the guy should improve, right? But the question is, at what point do the Cardinals start looking at numbers and concern themselves with the production? And can Victor Scott be a productive player for the Cardinals, even if the numbers aren't stellar? I I would argue, first of all, that with his propensity to play great defensively in center field, that he can be productive. But... I wonder what the on-base number is for him to... What, what's the magic number to keep him in the major leagues? The magic number? Yeah, I think that he just needs on. to at least be average, league yeah. average, in my opinion. And right now, you're right, the numbers are not there with him at the plate, but still, I like the spark that he provides. We talked about the small ball that we saw in the third inning, and it started with that hustle double by Victor Scott the second. And it's little things like that that this team was missing last year that you're starting to see now, and Victor Scott the second is a big part of that. I want him to stay here. And I think that, honestly, this is something that maybe you wouldn't even have to consider for a little bit longer because Tommy Edmonds' status is still up in the air. Mm -hmm. So even with Lars Newtbar coming back, he's going to be off the injured list as early as tomorrow. Even with him coming back, you put him in left field, you have Victor Scott the second as your center fielder, you have Jordan Walker in right field, and then you send down Michael Ciani, who has been fine, but if we're talking about bats right now, he's fine. I think he's a great defender and obviously fielder, but at the plate, not so much right now, and maybe he could develop with some more time. This is a situation I don't even think you have to worry about this moment. Victor Scott the second is staying here. Deciding factor for me is that he has to play. Mm -hmm. And so if you have injuries that all of a sudden heal, and Tommy Edmond is back, and Dylan Carlson is back, and Lars Newpar is back, that's going to make the decision a little bit more difficult for the Cardinals because he has only had three hits in 22 at bats. Now, very, very small sample size. But the other part that I, I love about him in six games, he scored four runs. And much of that is due to his aggressive nature. The other part of it, too, is that over the long haul, he's going to save you some runs. 
Mm-hmm. So remember how they always talked about Ozzy. He he's going to score you some runs, but he's going to maybe save you more runs than he winds up scoring. And so, you know, his defense is something that stands out to me. But the three for 22, eh, don't like to see that. But if he finds a way to get on base, he's third in strikeouts right now on the team. He's got eight for the year. Mm-hmm. He, he's just got to show a little bit more of a propensity to be an offensive player for me. And as he adjusts, you would hope that that'll be the case, although the league will adjust to him, too. Brooke, you mentioned league average on base. Last year it was 320. This year already it's 321. So that's not overwhelming. If he's hitting seventh for you and has an on base of 320, I'm with you there. If he, if he can get to league average there and hit seventh or eighth, with the defense that he provides, if he's getting on base 32% of the time, that means that you have essentially at least a double uh, every time he gets on 32% of the time. So that'd be awesome. And I would take that, and I don't think that's something that should be unexpected from him either. What is the only reason that you guys would send him down, possibly? Is that he's getting buried offensively. Mm -hmm. Um, Because defense, he's already shown. He's probably going to be an elite defender, if not an elite defender already. But if he, you know, if you project the numbers out and he's 6 for 44 and then go a little bit further than that and he's all of a sudden 12 for 88, you know, that that to me would concern me. And I I just want to be careful with him. And, yes, I'm excited about watching him. I love watching him play. Every time he's up, I stop to sit there and say, I want to see what he does. But, again, you know, he's such a young player. You just got to be careful and make sure that he doesn't get buried at this level. Tony LaRusso was very cognizant of breaking a player, bringing him up and giving him a couple of hundred at bats and all, all of a sudden you go 20 for 100 or 20 for 200 and your confidence takes a hit when you're hitting 100 after 200 at bats exactly. hard to bounce back from so i agree with that 100 percent. you don't want the player's confidence to be affected although he looks like a really confident young oh, player yeah. he does but you don't want his players his numbers you don't want him to look at his numbers and think that he can't do it i i think he can it's just going to take a little time and I, the other part is when a player struggles, they put so much pressure on themselves. And I, I'm sure that he feels pressure right now to say, uh-oh, these guys are coming. What does that mean for me? I mean, that's human nature. How could he not look over his shoulder and say that certain guys are, are going to get healthy? And what does that mean for me? If I'm the manager, I just say, hey, you're in the lineup every day. Go do what you do. And yeah. don't worry about it. And we're going to play every day as long as you're here. Yeah, by the way, we I asked about a magic number. Let me give you that magic number again. Brooke, you, you said league average. Last year, la- league average on base was 320. This year, it's 321. Vince Coleman's rookie year, 1985. His on base average was 320. Is that oh, right? Wow. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. If he gets on base 320, I think he sticks around. I think he steals yeah. a lot of bases. 100%. Yes. Yeah. So, and then Dylan Carlson, when he returns. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, you need a rehab stint. Let's, let's go spend 20 days in the minors. 20 might be uh, a little much, but you know what? Well, that's the maximum I can give him. <laughs> exactly. I want him to prove to me that he can stay healthy. And I know that this is a fluke injury, but I want him to. And I, I still think that Dylan Carlson, and now it's getting questionable as to whether or not he can stay healthy. But I still think Dylan Carlson has talent. I just want to be able to see him play. I've always felt like if you're a really good team, he's your fourth outfielder. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The last couple of years, I felt that. I wonder if he left this situation and went to a lesser team to where he's just going to play every day. Don't worry about it. The wins and losses are going to be what they're going to be. Where in St. Louis, you're expected to win. What kind of numbers he would put up, knowing that he's going to get 500 at bats, knowing he's in the lineup every day. Because what happens is that a guy like Dylan Carlson or others that are on the bench that are not veterans, they put a lot of pressure on themselves when they get that chance to play. Like, I got to go four for four to stay in the lineup. Yeah. And I, I think some of that has happened to him. This team coming into town, would be, the, the Marlins, would be a perfect, perfect destination for him. Yes, it would. Not a lot of pressure. Yeah. Not a lot of fan pressure. And Skip knows him, knows about him, sure. knows how to push the buttons. I think I think he'd be an interesting Marlin. That is today's Fresh Take here on 101 ESPN. Coming up, the Blues back in action tomorrow night at Nicheville. And we're going to talk to Jamie Rivers about the Blues and their chances to make the playoffs. Coming up next on 101 ESPN. And now, the big down payment. (laughs) Not today, mister. Who are you? The down payment busters. 
at Frank Lee to Mitsubishi in the Automotive Outlet in Bridgeton. Every vehicle is just $29 down. $29 at Frank Lee to Mitsubishi. That's absurd. Can I blast him now? Uh, let's finish the commercial first. St. Louis Blues as we head into the Blues booth. Presented by Boardwalk Hardwood Floors, a proud partner of your St. Louis Blues. Find your perfect new floor at our four convenient locations and online at BoardwalkHardwood.com. The Blues return to action tomorrow night. They are at Nashville to take on the Predators. We'll have the pregame for you at 6 and the action at 7 for you right here on your home of the St. Louis Blues, 101 ESPN. And Jamie Rivers will be on the call as the Blues return to Valley Sports. Way too many national games that aren't uh, called by J.K. and Rivs of late. The Blues are right now three points out of the final playoff spot in the West. And... Uh, Jamie, first of all, good morning. Second of all, you said the other day that if the Blues could get within three, you gave them a chance. What are you thinking today? <laughs> yeah, this Blues team is toying with our emotions, aren't they? Um, look, I think the other night was a huge win, obviously. You got yourself within three points of the L.A. Kings. These next couple of games are going to be interesting because the L.A. Kings uh, tomorrow night play the San Jose Sharks, who we know are not a good team. They However, are, I, we I also they were know, great last time I saw them. <laughs> well, that's exactly where I was headed, Randy. I said, we also know they're unpredictable. Um, so that's going to be an interesting game for the Kings. The same night the Blues will play the Predators. But then the next game for each team will be the Blues playing 
the Sharks again, and the LA Kings had the Vancouver Canucks. So obviously it's supposed to be one winnable game, one tough game for each team. For me, the team that can win both games while the other team splits, I mean, that will be the difference maker, obviously. Well, the last time we saw the Blues face the Predators, I mean, it is always such a physically dominant team over there in Nashville. What is the best way to slow down the Predators? Which, by the way, they have cooled off just a little bit. They have lost three straight after falling to the Bruins last night. You can't turn the pucks over against the Predators. That's the bottom line. And, you know, they've got a couple of really talented players. Obviously, Roman Yossi on the back end. For me, the best way to eliminate Roman Yossi is to continuously just put the puck behind him. Make him turn, make him go get the puck all all game long. And then anytime you can get a hit on him, you get a hit on him, but you have to stay on the defensive side after. So you got to be playing a very physical, disciplined game to try and eliminate Roman Yossi. And of course, I use the word try because I think eliminating him from all of it is you know almost impossible. But he's the cog that gets things going back there. And then up front, obviously, they've got our old friend Ryan O'Reilly, Forsberg, Nyquist. These guys are all having really good seasons for that team. You just you have to manage the puck really well. And when you get your opportunities, you got to make sure you capitalize on them. But that is a good team, and they work extremely hard, so it's not going to be an easy one. All right, Jamie, some of the big news this morning. Jimmy Snuggerud laying in his bed at home Tuesday morning said he made this decision. He was returning to the Gophers for his junior season. Uh, just your reaction to that. Yeah, finding out some of the details now, I'm I'm quite surprised because I'm not going to lie, if you turn to me at any point in my junior career and said, hey, by the way, Jamie, I want you to come and finish the season, put a blue note on, and you're going to be a St. Louis blue, I, I mean, I would have jumped at the opportunity to do that. Uh, now, you know, Jimmy Snuggerud, maybe, maybe this is the best play for him. Maybe he knows that he's maybe not quite re- ready yet. He did mention that, you know, he did, wasn't happy with the way he finished the season this year and feels like he's got more to to learn. And he's got more to, more to develop playing in college hockey right now. And, and maybe it's the best decision. I don't know. For me, getting to the NHL, getting NHL games under your belt, playing with guys that you're going to play with again next year and getting to know your surroundings, for me, that's the biggest value right there is starting your NHL journey. But – Hey, kids are wired differently these days, and who knows? Maybe the long game works out better for Jimmy. Did you think that this was surprising for the Blues, like their front office? Did they expect him to come to sign and be a part of this race down the stretch, or are they kind of like ho-hum with this and he's going to play another year and eventually we'll get him? I think they're probably surprised. You know, From what I'm hearing with Army being involved, talking to the family, uh, Alexander Steen reaching out and talking to Jimmy Snuggerud. I believe Braden Shen even reached out to Jimmy Snuggerud via call or text, or I can't not sure which one, but that's a lot of pushing all the chips to the middle of the table for the Blues. That's more than I, you know, look at Army. We know how Army is. He's very calculated, holds his cards close to the chest. And, you know, for him to go overboard and to bring in other people from the front office and even on the team to, kind of welcome this kid in and get him to make his decision. That tells me the Blues were counting on him coming in for the last handful of games and getting him going. So it's surprising. You know, I think that the Blues are probably a little surprised that Jimmy decided to go back. But at this point, you embrace it as an organization and you continue to watch his development over the next year. And everybody hopes and prays and crosses their fingers that nothing happens during his season next year that would slow down his next step to the NHL. Yeah, you're right, Jamie. I mean, at this point, they just have to embrace it at this point. So outside of gaining experience for Jimmy Snuggerud, what is the benefit here for the Blues organization? Uh, the benefit for the Blues organization is that, you know, what if he's what if he's not quite ready? And then you have a player on your roster that you're trying to find reps for. Uh, I mean, we look at, we're talking already about Victor Scott all the time. There's one aspect of his game that's completely major league ready. There's one aspect that's not. We know that. So if it was Jimmy Snugger, we flipped the script here a little bit. You know, what if his defensive play is nowhere near NHL ready? He's got an NHL shot. We know that. That's great. But that's only one part of the game. And then if you're pot committed to the young man that he's going to be on your roster, now as a team, you're trying to just find him ice time to where 
It's helping him develop. You're trying to hide him at times, which that's not the way to do it. That's not the best way to develop a player. Um, you know, so the benefit for the Blues is that he'll go back to Minnesota for another year. He'll probably be the captain of that team. He should have a great year. The team apparently is going to be loaded up again to take a shot at a national championship. And all of those things carry value, too, in the development of a young player. Rivs, it seems like with the the way we're talking here that if the Blues were counting on him, that'll have to change the way they approach the offseason in terms of procuring top six or top nine wingers, too. Yeah, it is, and that's what's interesting, too, Randy. That's why I was a little taken back by Jimmy Snuggerer's decision because, like, the Blues now have to go fill that void. They have to go find that scoring top winger somewhere. And if they decide to do that, let's, let's say they go get a guy, make a trade to get a young guy who's a 25, 30 goal scorer. You know, maybe you have the cap space in the offseason to do it. And now you find your guy. You know, that now is a bit of a roadblock moving forward for Jimmy Snuggerud. So there's always a risk. You know, the Wally Pip thing is real. And, you know, so you worry about that a little bit. But to your original question, yeah, the Blues have to do something. So Doug Armstrong has about five or six guys that I would say are pillars on this team. And after that, he's got a, a group of guys that are good guys, good players. And then there's guys that he's going to move on from. And then there's going to be trades that he tries to manufacture with other teams. He's going to try and find salary cap space. He's going to try and find a scoring winner. He's going to try and upgrade that defensive score. Uh, he's got a lot on his plate for this offseason and probably next offseason too. But we certainly know that secondary scoring has to get better. What do you think it's like in the room with the guys that he would have played with and they say, really, he doesn't want to be here? Or do you think it's a situation where they just say, well, you know what? That's the way it is. Those are kids today. Yeah, and guys don't care. Yeah. (laughs) They're sitting in the room. Some of them are probably happy because that means they're going to be in the lineup for the last games of the season because we know how that works. If you're a bubble guy and then the young kid comes up, You're sitting out and the young kid's playing. But there's no real, I don't think there's any heavy discussion about it, Dan. I think that guys realize that he's being advised, whether it's by an agent or his family member. Let's not forget his dad had a nice long NHL career too. And and maybe he knows that his son is not quite ready to be a difference maker yet in the NHL. And maybe he said, hey, let's pump the brakes. So guys in the locker room right now, they're focused on trying to get into these playoffs. And if Jimmy Snuggerud would have been a part of it, great, you welcome him in. But if he's not, you're like, well, oh, well, next man up. we got to get this done. Yeah, makes sense. Hey, Rivs, one more thing that I find interesting, because I heard yesterday and read on social media about Snuggerud and NIL. And it's interesting, when you look at the NIL deals, and I I don't have the individual numbers, I'll come up with those, but when you look at the NIL deals at the University of Minnesota, uh, the, the women's hockey players at Minnesota make more than the men's hockey players in NIL money. Yeah, no, that's a fact. And we had somebody on the text line yesterday ask us, you know, do you think he's staying in Minnesota because of NIL money? And I was like, no, not even close. Like, Let's just let's just be real for a second here. The, the girls' team, they get a lot of the money. But Minnesota and, and some of these schools that are not football schools or football factories, there's NIL money. But it's not like we're reading about. It's not like the guys that we talk about all the time with the college football programs and things like that. He, maybe he's getting a little bit of NIL money, but it, in no way would it be enough to stop him from taking an NHL paycheck. Trust me, the NHL paycheck eclipses the NIL money. All right. Ribs will be tuned in tomorrow. Thanks so much. We'll be tuned in this afternoon for are you are you doing the fast lane or are you in the air today? I will be in the air today, unfortunately. All right. So we will hear from you tomorrow and then blues and predators tomorrow night. Thanks, Ribs. Always good to have you with us. All right, thanks, guys. Have a great day. You too. Take care. That is Jamie Rivers, our colleague here at 101 ESPN. He, of course, co-host of The Fast Lane with Anthony Stalter and Kerry Davis, and you'll hear him with John Kelly tomorrow night on Bally Sports. I'm disappointed. I'll be honest. I wanted to see Jimmy Snuggerud here. I think the Blues are, too. Yeah, I do, too. They are. That was very kind of an interesting and sad tidbit about you had Alexander Steen and Braden Shen reach out mm-hmm. trying to convince him. So the Blues really were looking to have him come here. And Dan, you mentioned the offseason moves. This changes a lot with that. I, I agree. I, I just look at the experience he would have gotten here down the stretch is 
immeasurable when you think about starting your pro career where you have seven games left. And who knows if he would have played uh, tomorrow night, but he would have played a handful of these games down the stretch. And that kind of experience, man, you, you just you can't find that anywhere else. No. <laughs> a chance to be in a playoff race down the stretch. And for the Blues, if they think he's the player that he is supposed to be that gives this team a jolt so very disappointed that uh, he didn't sign today even if he would have started in the ahl you're still going to be a factor going into next season i i wanted him to be a factor with the blues right now yeah me too right mm-hmm. now and now let's figure he would have been a 20 goal score now you got to go out and find yeah a 20 goal score and i wonder if this expedites the ascent of Dvorsky. I wonder if the Blues take a closer look at yes. him because of the, the absence of Snuggerud. And that makes sense. Yeah. That's Dan. That's Brooke. That's Matthew. I'm Randy. Coming up, we need a fighter for the fight here on 101 ESPN. Give us a text. 314-399-9646. 314-399-YOHO. And if you text in to that number with your name and the word fight, maybe Matthew will pick you to fight me next on 101 ESPN. It's time for a DraftKings at Casino Queen Redbird Report on 101 ESPN. Brooke Grimsley here for your Redbird Report. The Cardinals with their first series win of 2024. Miles Michaelis rebounding in his second start of the season, tossing six innings, giving up two earned runs, seven hits, walking one while striking out four for his first quality start of the year. At the plate, Wilson Contreras with a two-run go-ahead homer in the sixth, Brendan Donovan going two for four at the plate to help the Cardinals beat the Padres five to two. On the injury front, the Cardinals are moving Sonny Gray's rehab start scheduled for today to a sim game due to rain. He's still slated for 50 pitches. With the Memphis Redbirds last night, Lars Newbar in left field, he went 0 for 3 with an RBI and run scored. He will DH for Memphis today. Your big league Redbirds are back in action today as they go for their first sweep of the season before heading back here to St. Louis. First pitch is at 310 with Zach Thompson on the mound. The Redbird Report is presented by DraftKings at Casino Queen. Play, stay, dine at DraftKings at Casino Queen.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Cardinals yesterday with a 5 2 win over the Padres. They've taken the first two games of this series, and they will go for the sweep this afternoon. Game three against the Padres, a 3 10 first pitch. It'll be Zach Thompson 0 1 on the season, facing off against Joe Musgrove. Also 0 1 on the season. Little difference there. Musgrove went over eight for the Padres in his first start, but he did have a 9 7 2 ERA across that start. Blues will be back in action tomorrow, facing off against the Predators. You can catch the game here in your home for the St. Louis Blues, 101 ESPN. 7 p.m. puck drop, 6 p.m. pregame show. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American Sand Heating and Air Conditioning dealer. to the opening drive brooke dan randy and rock here and it is time for the fight and our fire today is ruben ruben how are you doing i'm doing well how are you doing this morning i'm doing great is this your first time facing randy in the fight it is oh okay how are we feeling uh well um considering he only got two yesterday i'm <laughs> I'm figuring I probably need to go four for four to even compete this morning. <laughs> okay. I, you, you had me in the first half. I'm not going to lie. So I didn't know where that was going to go. All right. We wish you the best, Ruben. You ready for question number one? Let's go. Jalen Hurts has run for at least 10 touchdowns three years in a row. Who is the only other quarterback in league history who's run for double-digit touchdowns in multiple seasons? Is it Cam Newton, Josh Allen, or Marcel Stewart? I'm sorry, what was the third one? What was the third option? Cordell Stewart. Cordell the third Stewart. Option. Okay. Cordell Stewart. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, give it to me one more time. It was, Do you want me to read the question to you again? Yeah. No, uh, no just, just, the, just the names, please. Okay. I'm sorry. Cam Newton, Josh Allen, or Cordell Stewart? Multiple. I'm going to go with Cam Newton. Okay, let's go to question two. The Black Sox scandal resulted in a changing of MLB's governing body with the creation of a sole office of commissioner. What mm -hmm. was the original governing body called? Was it the National Baseball Commission, MLB Board of Directors, or League Presidents Coalition? Let's go with A. Okay, national. I, I thought you were going to ask me about Landis Shaw. I was like, I got this one. <laughs> no, you're, you're on your way, man. That was good. National Baseball Commission is your answer, and we move to question three. Question three, Ruben. Who was the last wide receiver to top 1,000 yards in St. Louis Rams, in a St. Louis Rams jersey, excuse me? Was it Brandon Lloyd, Troy Holt, Tory Holt, or Kenny Britt? I got to go with Tory Holt. All right, question like four. Double checking the spelling of everything. <laughs> the Celtics hold the longest professional championship streak with eight, a streak that started in 1959 and ended when this Eastern Conference team won in 1967. Is it the Bucks, the Knicks, or the 76ers? Fifty-nine to sixty-seven. Fifty-nine to sixty-seven. I uh, I gotta think that's a uh, big O. So I'm going with the Bucks. Okay, let me go grab Randy. How do you feel there, Ruben? I don't. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> you you never know, Ruben. It can go a million <laughs> different ways. And sorry about some of that. Yeah, my, that's my fault. The number one uh, autocorrect apparently just doesn't uh, doesn't recognize certain names still, and uh, it got me on that one. So uh, it happens. My apologies on on, on to autocorrect and to Ruben and to Brooke. We're going to make it through it, right, Ruben? <laughs> there we go. And here's Randy with his washed grapes today. Uh huh. Say hi to Ruben. Ruben, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, sir. Good morning to you, too. Okay, I've always wanted to ask somebody named Ruben this question. What's your oh. favorite kind of sandwich? Uh, Philly cheesesteak. Oh, okay. Oh, really? I, I, I wondered if it might be a Ruben. <laughs> Do you like Ruben. Rubens? <laughs> I love Ruben. <laughs> it's great to have you with us. Thanks for listening. Thanks for Randy. playing. Randy! 
<laughs> Ready for question number one, Randy? Ready. Jalen Hurts has run for at least 10 touchdowns three years in a row. Who is the only other quarterback in league history who's run for double-digit touchdowns in multiple seasons? The only name that strikes me right off the top is Cam Newton. I will go with Cam Newton as my final answer. Question two, Randall. Yes, sir. The Black Sox scandal resulted in a changing of MLB's governing body with the creation of a sole office of commissioner. Uh -huh. What was the original governing body called? With the sole office of the commissioner? This would be Rock prior to that, correct? Yes, yes so prior they to changed the Black Sox. They went to, oh, to so the commissioner. Prior to Kennesaw Mountain Landis, correct. there was a group of people. I'll do the lifeline. National Baseball Commission. MLB Board of Directors, League Presidents Coalition. Okay, I'm going to, uh, what was the first one again? National Baseball Commission. National Baseball Commission. That sounds like more 20s stuff. The National Baseball Commission was started as a result of the Black Sox scandal in 1919. <laughs> so it's certainly not the Board of Directors, right? So we're talking newsreels here. And then the third one was called League Presidents Coalition. The League Presidents Coalition was started. I'm going to go with the first one. I'll go with A, final answer. National Baseball Commission. The National Baseball Commission was started as a result of the Black Sox scandal, scandal that saw Shoeless Joe Jackson get suspended by Major League Baseball for life. Is that Actually, like a transatlantic so accent? No, this is, uh, don't, you, don't you remember, like, uh, have you ever seen newsreels? Like, they yeah. played them before movies. Oh, and so, okay. Now, here's the thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I was right. I was just trying to make sure that I was right about Shoeless Joe Jackson. He got suspended by Kennesaw Mountain Landis, but I'm thinking this is like a, a 1923 newsreel. So kind of a historical marker. As I think were. you nailed it. Thank you. <laughs> I think you nailed it. It was great, Randy. The Black Sox scandal continues <laughs> as they research and do their due diligence on Joe Jackson. Yep. Major League Baseball owners have hired Kennesaw Mountain Landis as the commissioner. <laughs> who provides the, the, the owners provide Mr. Landis the opportunity and the ability to suspend any player that he deems has done something detrimental to the sport of baseball. Wrongdoing. <laughs> Wrongdoing, yes. <laughs> and henceforth... <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. That was great, guys. I went with A. I enjoyed it. Okay, you went with A. Good to know. <laughs> All right, question three. Who was the last wide receiver to top 1,000 yards in a St. Louis Rams jersey? St. Louis Rams jersey. St. Louis Rams jersey. Okay, so point of parliamentary procedure. When they went to L.A., they were still wearing the St. Louis Rams jerseys, and Kenny Britt caught 1,000 yards. From nineteen, from when they got here in the mid-'90s through 2015. That would have been Torrey Holt. Who was the last in that yeah. chronological yeah. order. Torrey Holt in 08, I believe. I was just, that would have been uh, a clunkier uh, way to word it. I have been, I have been tricked before. <laughs> It's very fair that you've asked this, Randy, yeah. because we have seen, we have seen that. Yeah. You never so, know. So what Kenny this Brett was wearing here. the St. Louis Rams jersey in L.A. when he got 1,000 yards, but no, it was Torrey Holt. Okay, question four. <laughs> <laughs> he was, wasn't he, Matthew? The fact that you know that Kenny Britt got 1,000 in L.A. is wild. <laughs> Are you ready for question four? <laughs> the Celtics hold the longest professional championship streak with eight. Mm -hmm. Championship streak with eight. Mm -hmm. A streak that started in 1959 mm -hmm. and ended when this Eastern Conference team won in 1967. 1967 Eastern Conference squad. 1967. I'm going to go... I don't know if it's the Warriors or the Sixers. I'm going to go with the Philadelphia 76ers. Final answer? Yeah, I guess so. I think Wilt was there. Okay. I'll go with uh, I'll, I'll go with Philadelphia. Whoever Philadelphia was, I'll do, I'll do Jeopardy. Who was Philadelphia? <laughs> well, Ruben said that he was going to need to get all four right to beat Randy Carricker. He heard he got two right yesterday, and he was like, well, I'm going to need to get all four to beat Randy Carricker. So the big question is, did Ruben get all four right? Does he beat Randy Carricker, or does Megamind walk away with his third straight victory of the day? Ring that bell. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. The winner and still champion of the fight. The fight is presented by Golf Discount of St. Louis with the most experienced club fitters in town. Why shop anywhere else? I am so sorry, Ruben. He got you with the very last question and he beat you four to three today. 
Hey, great time, man. This this was really fun. <laughs> Ruben, <laughs> thank, thank you, you so Ruben. much, man. Thanks for checking in and have a great day. You too. Let's go through the questions and the answers. Jalen Hurts has run for at least 10 touchdowns three years in a row, and Cam Newton is the only other quarterback to do that, and he did it uh, like nine years apart, too, which is wild when you think about it, where his body was. It's not Morsell Stewart. It's not Morsell Stewart. Thank you, for, <laughs> thank you, Otto Fred, for butchering my... You know what? I thought that was... If the, piece of, if the piece of paper is put in front of me, like, right before... I'm just going to read it. This is, gonna, can, this, is Randy's, <laughs> this is Randy's thing, though. Like, this is... I, I try to trick people, and uh, once, uh, every once in a while, I try to get tricky by putting in Cordell Stewart. I'm like, hey, people remember Slash. That's a fun name for quarterbacks who ran. Let's put in Cordell Stewart and throw a curveball. And then autocorrect says, you know what? We're going to ruin your 830. Yeah, that's a curveball. You, you, you jerk. Uh, the Black Sox scandal resulted in the change of MLB's governing body with the creation of the sole office of commissioner who they hired Kennesaw Mountain Landis. It was, in fact, the National Baseball Commission. The before National that. Baseball Commission. The way you broke that down was so perfect because I was trying to think of ways to make it sound like a 1920s thing, hence why I use the word coalition. Uh, who was the last wide receiver to top a thousand yards in a St. Louis Rams jersey. It was in fact Tory Holt in 07. The highest after that was 784 by Kenny Britt. Mm -hmm. uh, he did get a thousand and two in his first year in LA in a still, I guess, technically St. Louis <laughs> Rams jersey. And the Celtics hold the, long, the longest professional championship streak with eight, a streak that started in 59 and ended when the 76ers won in 67. They did in fact beat the San Francisco Warriors to win that championship. And by the way, just for all trivia people out there, when the Milwaukee Bucks won their first championship with Kareem and Big O, they were a Western Conference team. Really? Do not get confused. But that was 1970, right? Yeah, it was. But I'm just saying, I put that in there. Don't get confused because I was looking through that stuff and I was like, wait, they were a Western Conference team when they won that. So if, if anyone tries to get you with that one, that first Bucks one is a Western Conference championship, not from the Eastern Conference. But a 4-3 win for Randy Carricker today in the fight. Thank you again for Ruben for joining the fight and joining the show today. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Ruben. Okay, I was mildly paying attention before the fight because I was getting into the zone. Do we change our next segment or are we still doing it? We're going to be talking about Wilson Contreras in the next segment, Okay, Randy. good. Next on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
All right, it is a Wednesday, and it's Danny Mac for Stewart's American Mortgage. If you're someone who is looking to purchase a home, you need to call Stewie. Stewie, what's happening with the home purchase market right now? Well, Danny, what we want to talk about today is low down payment. There's a lot of misinformation that's out there. People are on social media and saying, hey, you know what? If I want to buy a house, how much do I have to put down as a down payment? Well, this individual went to their realtor's referral lender, and he said in order to put the minimum down, which is 3.5%, you have to go FHA. That is wrong. We have a 1% down conventional program. If you're buying a house out in the boonies, you may be able to get USDA, 100% financing, 3% down if you're a first-time home buyer. There's all kinds of options out there. Conventional loans are better than FHA. Make sure that you connect with somebody who has experience and always get a second opinion. This is the biggest investment you're going to make in your life. Make sure you feel comfortable in getting the best. So that's pretty easy. If you're someone who is looking to purchase a home, refi, or if you're looking to consolidate some of that ugly credit card debt, you don't know where to go, what direction to take. Call Stewie from Stewart's American Mortgage. Call him directly on his personal cell phone. He will answer. You can text him as well. 314-324-4440. 314-324-4440. Or you can Google the bagel loan. NMLS number 226715. We have a really good chemistry. We're not, we're not taking anything for granted. Uh, we just, we just do it together. We lose and winning together, and that's what's gonna make us better. I think uh, having uh, that good, really good mix of uh, veterans and, and young guys is, is really good for a team, and we holding every, every everybody accountable. That's the Cardinal catcher, Wilson Contreras, who over the first six games has been terrific. He's been great defensively, and Dan mentioned earlier some of the defensive statistics, which we'll get to. He's second on the team with an 863 OPS. Yes, the batting average is only 176, but he's getting on base. And most importantly, he's doing what the Cardinals got him for, and that's to hit for power. He's got a couple of home runs, home runs in each of the last couple of games, and he's gotten on base to the tune of three walks in six games. Striking out a little bit more than the Cardinals would like, but overall, even though his numbers can get better, Wilson Contreras has been a plus, I think, for the Cardinals rather than a minus. He really has been, and there's many different ways that he has been a plus. One, I think that now that you have everything with last year behind you, you can sell that you can tell that he has the confidence that he's brought in, but it's a very like organic confidence that he has right now, and he feels a lot more settled into his role. You mentioned the batting average is low, but the OPS is really good right now, and that will play. I'm curious what you guys thought about him and the position he was in last night where he's in the three hole for the Cardinals. I like that currently right now because I think it's something that could really benefit him when we talk about the OPS. And I think that with the way that Gorman is going right now, Gorman normally hits the ball really hard. And oh, so far, not only are his numbers not great, but he doesn't he's not hitting the ball hard. He'll get going. And ultimately, I would love to have the left handed hitter breaking up Goldschmidt and Arenado. But you have a nice alternative if Gorman isn't going well. Wilson Contreras is a, a pretty good two, three, four. If you have Goldie hitting second, Contreras third, Arenado fourth. And the thing that looks different to me is defensively. I yeah. mean, he is stealing strikes. You wake up today, he's number one in baseball at those borderline pitches and stealing strikes. He just seems to have confidence now behind the plate, which is huge with the pitching staff. If they have confidence in him and vice versa, that is really big. And that's something that Miles Michaelis talked about last night after the win. Michaelis with a terrific performance, and he said Contreras had something to do with that. Yeah, I, I probably called just, you know, maybe 10 pitches. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not calling them all. 
Um, you know, Wilson and I get, you know, get together before the start. We're on the same page a lot right there. Um, but every once in a while, I'll see something, you know, that he might not. And sometimes he sees things that I don't. Um, so we'll go back and forth. But I probably called, you know, maybe a dozen or so pitches. And I think that helps. Um, the good thing about that kind of communication is it helps him kind of get on that same page as me so like I might call one pitch you know in the second inning and then I'm I don't think I called one again till like the fourth or fifth and you know and then some of that stuff is just me you know maybe being less confident in some of my stuff than him <laughs> or or me being more confident in, in in certain pitches than him so we're just kind of going back and forth and it's fun it's, it's it's a good thing to have last year his numbers offensively were much better when he was a catcher mm-hmm. um, and I think there's something to that when you're involved in every every single play defensively offensively you have your at bats he did not take his defensive woes at times to the plate and i think this guy's going to have a monster season in his second year second year with the cardinals and i can see how it can be a difficult adjustment for the cardinals starters all the pitchers when you never have to think you you not that they didn't work but they didn't have to work when yadi was their catcher because they never called their own pitches they never shook him off the good ones and now there is more preparation on the part of the Cardinals starters going into a start and good for Miles Michaelis to take control of his own destiny those 10 times. Well, Miles Michaelis and him had built a really good relationship that you could talk about even last season. Miles stuck, stuck up for him at mm-hmm. times, but you like what you're seeing from Wilson Contreras, not only from the offensive standpoint, but we even had a text just come in. His pitch framing has improved this year. You've noticed a lot of different factors of his game that have improved. And also, by the way, I think that villain Wilson Contreras is back. I just like the edge, the fiery passion that he brings to this team. But it seems just a little bit more different this year. Yeah, it. It, it is, and it, I think he got that in the in the second half last year. Once he started hitting, yep. and once the he confidence got confidence, yeah, and he back. got his personality back. He needed to have that confidence from being Wilson Contreras. He's got to be himself. And now Yadi's or uh, Yadi, uh, Ali's got his back a hundred percent. There's no question about that. And he's going to be the guy. The one thing I wonder, guys, is I thought before the season that he might p- play a hundred, a hundred and ten, and Herrera would get fifty. If he stays healthy, I wonder if that still remains the case. If Because they've got to keep, A, Herrera sharp, but B, they've got to advance Yvonne Herrera, too. So I wonder if he still gets 50 games during the course of the season. And you want to keep uh, Contreras' bat in the lineup. Mm-hmm. So then what happens to a Nolan Gorman? What happens to an Alec Burleson? It cuts into their ABs because if Contreras is not catching, now there will be sometimes you say he's got the day off. Mm-hmm. He's not going to do anything. But you want to keep his bat in the lineup. Where does it go if he's not catching? He's the DH. And I have to play the long game here because you and I are talking about Gorman has to hit against left-handers. Yep. So you can't just say, okay, on those days where a left-hander is pitching, we're going to go with an all-right-handed lineup and Gorman's not going to, going to participate. Gorman has to get experience against left-handed pitching if he's going to get any better against left-handed pitching. And I think it'll happen. I really do. I think we forget just how young he is. 23. Yeah, yes. he's he's still learning, and it was a breakout season with the 27 home runs last year, but he's still learning at this level, big yeah. time. So the Cardinals will be back in action today, and we would presume that Herrera would be behind the plate. Uh, day game after a night game, as the Cardinals have getaway day in San Diego, 3 o'clock game, and the Cardinals will pitch Zach Thompson today, and he'll be opposed by the Padre right-hander, the San Diego native, Joe Musgrove. Coming up, we've got our Rush Hour Reset on 101 ESPN.
Kids, the warm St. Louis summer heat is headed our way. Have you scheduled your air conditioner tune-up with Hoffman Brothers yet? When's the last time you changed your air filter? A friendly reminder from Hoffman Brothers that now is the time to get that tune-up scheduled. Don't wait until it stops working. That's bad when it's 100 degrees in St. Louis and your air conditioner stops working. Be good. The maintenance on your air conditioner once a year is just as important as oil changes in your car. Call today to schedule online. Uh, or all, all you need to do is hop on to the interwebs and go to Hoffman Bros, H-O-F-F-M-A-N-N, HoffmanBros.com, a proud Mitsubishi Electric Elite contractor. You can set up your appointment at 314-664-3011. And if your air conditioner was having a hard time keeping up with last summer's heat and you feel like you have hot and cold spots in your house, well, Hoffman Brothers can handle all of the needs, and that includes getting your air conditioning so that it's balanced in your house. Repairs, maintenance, and installation, they offer 0% financing for up to 36 months. It's Hoffman Brothers. Make sure that your air conditioner is good to go for the summer. Hoffman Bros, H-O-F-F-M-A-N-N, bros.com. We're recapping the biggest sports stories of the day on the opening drive with a rush hour reset. Nine oh six in St. Louis. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. Brooke Grimsley, Danny Mac, Randy Carricker. The Cardinals five two winners over the Padres last night at Petco, and the Cardinals are now three and three on this road trip. I figured they'd come home two and five, and so for me, regardless of what happens today at three o'clock when the Cardinals will pitch Zach Thompson against the right-hander Joe Musgrove, three ten game. Regardless of what happens, I think the Cardinals come home as winners with a three and four road trip. Four and three would be awesome, but uh, I'm very impressed that they have taken the first two and won the series in San Diego. Yeah, just because of all the noise coming out of that first series with the Dodgers, you were able to come away with a win there, which is a huge accomplishment. You were possibly able to split the series if it wasn't for Sunday's performance, but still, I wasn't expecting this against the Padres. Of course, a lot to do with Mike Schilt. This felt like the Mike Schilt series going into this because of all the stories that we know going into it, but still at the same time, the way that they're able to come out of this, I has it has a lot to do with with their starting pitching. Also, this young core of guys that you have right now. We talked about the small ball that working out for the Cardinals last night. Just the way that they were able to score that first run of the game there. I loved that hustle double by Victor Scott the second, the bunt by Siani, the moving over, which moved Scott over to third, and then win with that sack fly. That's something that we were missing, I felt like, at times last season, where they just had, they didn't have the ability, it felt like, at times to just manufacture runs in any way possible. Seems like fundamentals. Yeah. You know, they didn't do that last year. Defensively, they made a couple of plays that stood out. I thought the Donovan base running play scoring from third was huge. He stayed up with the bases loaded, kind of blocked the vision of the uh, defenders charging in to try to make a play on the force. Michaelis, a quality start, that's big. And then a timely home run from Contreras if you look at the last four starters for the Cardinals um, this is why they're winning in my opinion mm -hmm. it, it's pitching Lynn went four innings no runs and then the rain hit but Matt's five and a third gave up two Gibson seven two earned Michaelis last night six two earned 
you know, you pitch, you got a chance to win. Yep. It's really that simple. It'll never, never change. Meanwhile, the only winless team in baseball is the team the Cardinals will welcome to town for their home opener on Thursday. The Marlins are 0-6. They play the Angels today before making their way to St. Louis, and I'm sure this is not what Skip Schumacher expected. Did you guys see the home run hit by Mike Trout? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's almost yeah. 500 feet. It hasn't landed yet. It's <laughs> unbelievable. He's off to a great start, and there's been some long home runs, but that was as long as I bet is a home run he's hit in his career. Yeah, he's Trout, amazing. Adolis Garcia. Yeah, that was another one. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that was insane. You yeah. know, Zach Thompson goes tonight for the Cardinals. One of the things I'll be looking for, and I went back and looked at his previous start, he has changed his repertoire. Mm -hmm. Watch his changeup tonight. He threw a total of 24 changeups last year. He threw 22 in that first start against the Dodgers. So the chase rate he got on that was 44%. So if you're watching the game tonight, take a look at the chase rate that he gets or the effectiveness that he has with his change up here tonight. He's really a thinking man's pitcher. He's tried to emulate Clayton Kershaw, and that kind of got him going last year. And he still has the curveball, although it's a different curveball than he had last year, too. He's got five different pitches now. And the velocity is not where it quite needs to be. His velocity needs to be a little bit better. He's living around 90, 91, occasionally 92. That's been down. I think it's got to get up for him to be an effective starter this day and age of baseball. Yeah, or he needs to put it exactly where exactly. he wants it to be like John Tudor did back in the day. Good luck with that. <laughs> Not many did. There was one guy. Yeah. It, he was unbelievable, wasn't he? He was. He was great. That was Trout's fourth uh, longest home run in his career. Fourth longest. He, it was 473. He had a 490-footer four, four uh, um, a couple of years ago. Pretty good. Yeah, Pretty good. See, fun to watch. Blues at Nashville tomorrow night. The pregame at 6, action at 7 here on 101 ESPN. Also tomorrow night, the Blues opponent right now for the final wild card spot, the Kings, will play San Jose. So Blues just need to win every game. Even if San Jose, with eight games, or San Jose, the Kings go 5-3. and three. The Blues would have to win every single game, get two points out of every single game to surpass L.A. in the standings. So what L.A. is trying to do is go 5-3 and three because... I don't think the Blues are going 7-0. and Well, and then they're facing the mighty San Jose Sharks. We know, which we know is a very, very, very tough team. team. Yeah. I don't know why their record, record is like that right now, but that is a very, very <laughs> tough team <laughs> over there. And you have the Nashville Predators that the Blues will be facing tomorrow. I'm very interested to see how that will go because, as I mentioned earlier when, with the conversation with Jamie, they lost to the Bruins last night. They have lost three straight, so they've cooled off just a tad bit, but this is still a very physically dominant team. And if you wake up this morning and you don't know Jimmy Snow, Nuggerud is not a member of the Blues. He said, quote, a couple of nights ago, kind of felt like I wanted to sign, and then I woke up the next morning and didn't know again. So I just kind of sat by myself, thought about it all night, just kind of laying there thinking. Then this morning, yesterday, just had the realization and glimpse of what I thought the next year could hold. But this was the hardest decision I've ever made in my life so far. It isn't even close. So... Jimmy Snuggerud, not a member of the Blues just yet. Good to see a Golden Gopher, eh? Golden Gopher, they were defeated 6-3 from playing in, in his club uh, three days after playing in the NCAA fr uh, Frozen Four in St. Paul. Yep. And some drama. I'm going to read it directly from the AP story, okay, about the Kansas City vote yesterday. This is the lead for the AP story. The future of the Royals and Chiefs in Kansas City was thrown into question Tuesday night when residents of Jackson County, Missouri, resoundingly voted down a sales tax measure that would have helped fund a new downtown ballpark along with major renovations to Arrowhead Stadium. The Chiefs aren't going anywhere. No. No. They're going to be in Can It might not be at Arrowhead. They aren't going anywhere. They're probably going to be at Arrowhead with the Hunt family having to finance their desired renovations. And the Royals, much like the Cardinals, they were not able to get public funding. That Sherman guy is one of the richest owners in baseball, and he'll build his own ballpark because he knows how valuable it is to have a franchise. And those teams aren't going anywhere. They aren't, no, uh, and they won't. But the other thing here is, is that I kind of like the fact that you have people standing up for that in this sense, because I it feels like the NFL and you brought up the Rams earlier, Randy, when talking about that, it feels like the NFL knows that they've made it so much easier for the owners to be able to just be able to f have the public finance their own stadium. Well, think about this. The, the, the Hunt family has twenty four point eight billion dollars. Why do they need tax money to build a facility to house their business? Now, I know there's TIF funding out there. I know that out in 
Chesterfield Valley. I know that uh, Stan Kroenke got a bunch of tax increment finance money to, to build those things. But at the end of the day, why for a sports team do we need to finance their stadiums? I know it's great for our communities, but at the end of the day, the Cardinals are doing fine having built their own stadium. Well, the most valuable franchises in the NFL are the franchises that own their own stadiums. So there's nothing wrong with these guys building their own stadiums. I'm not saying I agree with it, but what would you say to your point, Randy, about what it means to community and what the Cardinals and Bush Stadium has meant to downtown St. Louis. I mean, if you did not have the Cardinals in Bush Stadium and Ballpark Village in downtown St. Louis, it'd mm-hmm. be scary to know what that thing would look like. Mm-hmm. Yes, it would. But and I, again, I'm no. not saying I agree with it. No, it, it is. It, and it's, hey, our morale as a region took a hit when the Rams left. And it does make you feel better when you when you have one of the 30 MLB teams or one of the 32 NFL teams. It does make somebody like me feel better about my region having those teams. But me too. <laughs> and my philosophy here changed when the NFL did what they did in moving the Rams because the Rams were offered $477 million. Well, they $477 million of public money was earmarked for a stadium that was actionable, despite what the NFL said. And Dave Peacock and Bob Blitz were ready to break ground on a new stadium. But the NFL said, no, we don't need that. We don't want that. We'll go build our own stadium, 100% financed by us, by one of our guys, and we're going to loan him money to do it in Los Angeles. Once we were told, once I was told that the NFL didn't need my public money, then fine, go build them yourself. I don't, uh, how can they say now, yeah, we need your public money when they told St. Louis, no, we don't. And this is a question I don't know because I haven't fully dove into this just yet, for, but from the through and four, would that tax have been Missouri wide or just KC area? Kansas City was a three ace of a cent sales tax this already in place by the way the tax money would not have gone up it it expires it sunsets next in 2025 next year and it would have just been maintained for another 40 years so 38 cents on every hundred dollars that you spend would have gone towards the upgrades and the upkeep of the stadiums so basically life would not have changed and life will not change for kansas city people when it's 38 cents per 100 dollars, people drop that on the parking lot you know, it, <laughs> so it, it wouldn't have made any difference at all. But I think they made a point. Good for them. Good for the people that voted no, that m- made a point and sent a message to these owners. And by the way, we had the same thing happen here with soccer. It, our soccer stadium got turned down initially. They, that was the Dave Peacock and the guy from Boston. And that got turned down by city voters. And thank God we have enterprise Taylor here in the, in the Taylor family yeah. to build their own stadium, City Park, which is a jewel not only here in St. Louis, but nationally among soccer stadiums it's as, and facilities. It's as good as it gets. What would this city look like without the Taylor family? <laughs> oh, wow. If we, uh, Forest Park for, uh, forever, yep. Soldiers Memorial. Arch grounds. Arch grounds. City, stadium. City schools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They've done a ton, man. They're ton. amazing. That is your Rush Hour Reset here on 101 ESPN. Don't look now, but the NL Central is off to an amazing start. It's coming your way on 101 ESPN.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke here, and this year we decided it was time to make a major upgrade to our home by updating our bathroom. We have this house in U City. We absolutely love it. It's over 100 years old, so it has a lot of charm to it, but we didn't exactly love our main bathroom. And this is really the first time we've ever done a really big project like this, making over our bathroom, and we weren't really sure where to start. So we decided to reach out to one of our great sponsors here of 101 ESPN, and that is EMB Granite. EMB Granite's team visit our house for a free consultation, and they can up with a vision of just how to really transform our bathroom. My favorite part of working with EMB Granite was stopping by their amazing showroom to explore their large selection of in stock custom countertops, all the different cabinet options. It was so much fun picking out the granite for the bathroom. And also, of course, my other favorite part was picking out the colors for the bathroom. Jen was the one who was working with us, and she has just been so much fun and easy to work with. And she had so many great ideas for us that just really fit within our budget. And that's what they do there at EMB be granted they've been doing it for over 20 years turning visions into realities so go and schedule your free consultation by calling 314-645-9300 or go online at embgranite.com or stop by their amazing showroom today and tell them that i sent you I'm buying the Pirates a little bit more than I have in the past because of what we've seen so far from Jared Jones with Paul Skeens now in the organization as well. But if you go back to something we wrote at the start of spring training, Stephen Nesbitt and I, ultimately this comes down to ownership. And will ownership at the deadline, if they're in it, be willing to increase payroll and do some things? They have not done that. And that story we wrote included some questions about their development, and they have had some fits and starts there. but. It seems like things are on the upswing. And I remember in that story, Ben Sherrington, the general manager, telling me that they believe they have a number of players who will be major leaguers coming out of their farm system and some who will be impact major leaguers. That's Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic on the 5-0 and Pittsburgh Pirates. There are only two divisions in baseball that don't have a team with a losing record. Nobody is surprised that one of them is the AL East. The Yankees are 5-1, and one, Red Sox 4-2, and two, Orioles 3-2, and two, and then the Rays and Jays are both 3-3. Three and three. The other one is the NL Central, the 5-0 and o Pirates, the 4-0 and o Brewers, the 3-2 and two Reds and Cubs, and then the 3-3 three and three Cardinals. Let's start with the Pirates. Ken Rosenthal with some inter interesting comments there, and that's the big question that Pirate fans have. Is it Bob Nutting going to do, if they're close, what is necessary to try to get them over the hump? I don't think he's going to do anything different than he typically does. I know that they've spent a little bit more money here recently, but still, it is the Pittsburgh Pirates at the end of the day, and this is a fantastic start for them. This is their best start since 1983, and we saw last year where they started a hot last season, and you declared them as? Uh, the 20 23 world champions by the way they opened the 1983 season right here against the defending world champion cardinals and swept the cardinals john candelaria pitched the opener uh, for the pirates and he just dominated the cardinals that day and uh, joaquin andohar i remember that yeah what made me sad the candy man me too what was the name of the other guy's pitcher or the other team's pitcher of uh, our team no the other other oh, team. john candelaria See, I don't like there's a Candelario in the, in the NL oh, Central. Now, oh, I'm oh, yeah. now I'm getting worried. Yeah, the Candyman can. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the Pirates, yeah, they weren't that great either that year, but the Cardinals kind of scuffled. Anyway, uh, yeah, a great start for the Pirates at 5-0, and oh, but I don't think they're the biggest threat in the division. I, I still think even though, though the Cubs are only 3-2, and two, and uh, it, it's the first week of the season, I still think the Cubs have the chance to be the best team. I don't know about this Paul Skeens guy. He could be a difference maker for Pittsburgh. I love, by the way, for Pittsburgh, 143 years, 
of playing baseball in mm-hmm. Pittsburgh. I mean, it's a historic franchise. It's just fallen on hard times. It's only the sixth time they've gone five and zero oh to start a season. Wow, that's hard to believe. Yeah, Marco Gonzalez pitched well last night and Ken Rosenthal was talking about what they do at the deadline normally they're sellers I I thought when they got to roll this Chapman I thought that's the perfect guy that when you get down the stretch someone's looking for a reliever power reliever maybe even a closer a roll this Chapman would be the guy that they would trade and if they're in it they've got to keep those kind of guys David Bednar roll this Chapman some of their starters it would just make sense to do it Randy, I think the team that I'm looking for, though, in the Central, and I've been bullish on them from the get-go, is the Reds. Frankie mm-hmm. Montas, Hunter Green, Graham Ashcraft, uh, who am I missing? Nick Martinez in the rotation. Guys, they're, they're going to be pretty good. They're going to be a handful. And apparently, they're at least according to what they did in the spring, they really are bullish on Hunter Green. Yes. Mm-hmm. Who's got as good Finally turning the corner. Yeah. Right. Yep, makes sense. Well, and also the Cubs, though, I think is another one. I think the Reds are going to be very interesting to watch this year. And then, of course, Ellie De La Cruz, what he brings to that team as well. But the Cubs, Shoto Managa looks really good. That was a pitcher that I was very interested in this offseason. And so far, he looks as advertised for the Cubs. It'll be dependent on what you do, I think, outside the division. I, I think these teams are fairly even. And uh, it'll it'll come down to what you do outside the division. They'll probably beat up on each other inside the central. And you may have teams. This, this whole season could be what we're seeing right now. Five or four mm-hmm. below or above 500. And uh, a bunch of teams together in that regard. And then all of a sudden it depends on what you do outside the division. And that will be how this is decided. And... Was it fan graphs that had all the teams in the division within six games of each other? Somebody did, did, right? Yeah, baseball prospectus. Yeah. I think it was within every team within six games. And I would not be at all surprised no. if we go into the final two weeks of this season and everybody does have a chance to win the division. What do you guys think? 85 wins? That wins it? Yes. That's what I believe. Yeah, I, I think 85 is that's the magic number. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if the Cardinals have 86, I'll be comfortable that they'll make the playoffs. Wild card not coming from the Central, so you're going gonna to have to win the Central. <laughs> no. And 86 wins might do it this year in 2024. Yeah. You're saying it won't stay this way, Dan, where you have the NL Central team uh, just no. riding high? Oh, okay. No. All right. I just don't see it. Well, and a couple of things. Number one, I don't know if Milwaukee really has an idea what they're doing. Why did you sign Hoskins and then get rid of Burns? <laughs> it, you know, it, it, that didn't Stop seem to make, stuff. Yeah, it, it didn't make any sense to me it, because I thought when they signed Hoskins, they would be trying to win this year. But then when you trade Burns, you're not. I think that right now, this might sound like heresy. Uh, I, I think the Cardinals starting rotation is better than Milwaukee's. Oh, I do too. And yes. So, and we don't know about the Reds. So you mentioned their starters, but we still don't know. They've, they've got ability. Is Montas, who came off, off a shoulder injury. Uh, Nick Martinez, I think, is, is pretty good. We saw for what Ashcraft can do last year. But... Uh, again, it all comes down ultimately to the depth of your starting pitching. Yes. I still think the, the Pirates, if they bring up Skeens and he's what's supposed to be what he's supposed to be, they might wind up having deeper starting pitching than the Cardinals. The Cubs council does; he just makes pitching. It's amazing, but. I, I think the Cardinals will be in the hunt if they can keep their starting pitching healthy. Sonny Gray, by the way, he is also on his way back it seems soon ish because he was supposed to have his rehab start scheduled for today but it seems like due to Ram, it's going to be a sim game but he's still going to be slated for 50 pitches for the reports he's supposed to be around for the opening day activities or not opening day excuse me home opener for the cardinals so he'll be around for that so it seems like he is right on track to be back here soon good when you're talking about the depth, go, that's what I'm talking about there. When you're talking about the depth with your starting rotation, having Sonny Gray back is 100% a good thing. Dan, how can you not laugh at that? I, I'm laughing on the inside. Okay. Laughing yeah. on the inside. <laughs> Internally, he's yes. laughing. Coming up here on 101 ESPN with uh, Brooke and uh, Dan. <laughs> I, I just, I make myself laugh. <laughs> I laugh, yeah. Okay, let's try We're it again. We're all laughing on the inside. <laughs> Get it, Sonny Gray was in Memphis, and now... Oh, is that what you mean by that? Yeah, for the... Okay. <laughs> Dan's Some, over Sometimes, us. No, sometimes my jokes just go over people's heads. I'm just listening. <laughs> I, I'm just taking... I'm like a listener. I'm taking just taking it all, it all in. Taking it all in. Yes. Okay. Good.
Coming up here on 101 ESPN, uh, what did we, we decide? Are we coming back to Kansas City? No, we're going to Snug Room. No, Snuggy. Snuggy, Snuggy, yeah. Snuggy, right. Yes. I got to pay attention more. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> 80%. Yeah. So I guess we aren't going to make the Snuggie Snuggie for next year. Next on 101 ESPN. I want you to do me a favor, and especially after we had three inches of rain in certain areas of the community over the last couple of days, make sure that your gutters are working as they should. What gutters are supposed to do is have your water go along the gutters and then down the downspout and out. The water isn't supposed to come over the side of the gutters that are filled up with leaves. So here's what, what you need to do is get in touch with my friends at gutterpros.com. Make an appointment. They'll come out and they'll take a look at your gutters and maybe your gutters just need to be cleaned out and get some leaf protection. They can do that. They'll do soffit and fascia for you. But if you need new gutters, maybe if your gutters are becoming detached from your home or if they're rusting out, Gutter Pros will tell you what the perfect gutters for your home are, and then they'll install them perfectly. It's a great St. Louis company. The general manager, Dave Sylvester, is a St. Louis guy. He loves St. Louis. As a matter of fact, you make an, uh, an appointment at GutterPros.com, he probably won't even need to use the GPS to get to your house. He'll know where your street is. If you are in the market for gutters, there's only one company to call. It's the A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, gutterpros.com.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals yesterday with a big win over the Padres, five to two. They will go for the sweep in their second series of the season with a game three today with a 3-10 first pitch. It'll be Zach Thompson, 0 and one on the season with an 8.44 ERA, facing off against Joe Musgrove, 0 and one on the season with a 9.72 ERA. Also, your St. Louis Blues will be back in action tomorrow, facing off against the Predators. It's going to be a 6 p.m. puck drop in Nashville. You can catch the pregame show right here on your home for the St. Louis Blues, 101 ESPN, starting at 6 p.m. That is your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Yeah, finding out some of the details now, I'm <clears throat> I'm quite surprised because I'm not going to lie, you, if you turn to me at any point in my junior career and said, hey, by the way, Jamie, I want you to come and finish the season, put a blue note on, and you're going to be a St. Louis Blue, I, I mean, I would have jumped at the opportunity to do that. Uh, now, you know, Jimmy Snuggerud, maybe, maybe this is the best play for him. Maybe he knows that he's maybe not quite re- ready yet. He did mention that, you know, he did, wasn't happy with the way he finished the season this year and feels like he's got more to to learn and he's got more to, more to develop playing in college hockey right now. And, and maybe it's the best decision. I don't know. For me, getting to the NHL, getting NHL games under your belt, playing with guys that you're going to play with again next year and, and getting to know your surroundings, for me, that's the biggest value right there is starting your NHL journey. That is our own Jamie Rivers earlier this morning here on 101 ESPN. Jeremy Rutherford has a great piece with Jimmy Snuggerud in The Athletic. And guys, I think this is the money quote because I believe, based on this quote, that if Minnesota had won the national championship next week, that Jimmy Snuggerud would sign with the Blues for next season. He said, quote to Jeremy Rutherford, I think another with another year at Minnesota, I can prove that I can play a full season here and I can be here for my teammates when they need me most. It was an unfortunate loss, but I think it influenced my decision to a point where I knew what I wanted to do. If they win, I wonder if his philosophy is any different. Now, here's one thing I will continue to think about Jimmy Snuggerud and this particular situation. Well, it would have been, it couldn't have been bad for him as an NHL player to play seven games with the Blues. Long term, how much of an advantage is it to have him here for these seven games and next year? Are the Blues close enough so that having the the two-year veteran Snuggeru two years down the road turns them into a Stanley Cup contender? I think that Number one, next year you don't sign him until after your season is over because you've got this experience now, and when he's ready to turn pro, you wait until his season is over, you wait until your season is over, give him the entry-level contract, and don't waste a year of his being an NHL player on seven games and get him for three years at $925,000 or whatever the, the cap number would be for a rookie. Well, and that's the thing is that I was hoping to see him soon just because I wanted to see what he would look like because then you can go ahead and get it started. I know that we had Jamie talking about that where if he was given that opportunity, if he's a junior in college, then he would take it in a heartbeat. And I think many others would, which makes all of this so surprising. But if you are looking for some positives looking ahead, it seems like that youth movement moving forward is going to be really solid with Dalbor Dvorsky. I wonder if this really pushes his timeline forward a little bit more. You have Zach Dean, you have Jake Neighbors. You have Bull Duke as well. So the youth movement should be really in full force here soon. We asked Jamie as well about the reaction from the Blues and maybe some of the players along the way when they found out that he would not be joining the club. I think they're probably surprised. You know, from what I'm hearing with Army being involved, talking to the family, uh, Alexander Steen reaching out and talking to Jimmy Snuggerud. I believe Braden Shen even reached out to Jimmy Snuggerud via call or text or I can't not sure which one, but... That's a lot of pushing all the chips to the middle of the table for the Blues. That's more than I, you know, look at Army. We know how Army is. He's very calculated, holds his cards close to the chest. And, you know, for him to go overboard and to bring in other people from the front office and even on the team to kind of welcome this kid in and get him to make his decision, 
that tells me the Blues were counting on him coming in for the last handful of games and getting him going. So I, I, I'm disappointed. I wish he would be uh, a St. Louis Blue this morning. One mm-hmm. of the other calls was made by Keith Kachuk, who is the Blues college scout, probably knows Jimmy Suggeru better than anybody in the organization. So, And we, we know that uh, Big Walt can be a persuasive sort. So Jimmy Suggeru has made his decision. Here's why I gave the timeline I did, by the way. If he joins the Blues for the 25-26 season, after next season, it's going to take him at least two years to become an impact player. He's not going to be an impact player coming out of college right away. So I think you're probably looking at the second half of 26-27 before he's an impact player. This has to change the way the Blues approach not only this offseason, but the pl- kind of player they get because they, they need another young top six forward because what they have now just isn't good enough. And maybe it is Dvorsky, but they're going to need some quality youth. They need another potential star up front well another thing that you've seen that they're missing here recently is just maybe another center mm-hmm. that's another thing that the blues have to address this offseason so i'm curious how this just really changes the trajectory of all of their plans because as we just heard there they're putting all their chips into having jimmy snuggerud around i love seeing a young man come in even with the seven games and with the playoff push that they're in and just seeing what he can do get the taste of the nhl get a taste of what is somewhat playoff hockey my concern would be if i'm the blues is him getting hurt Mm. now that would be something i'd be very very uh concerned about moving forward and you know you hope that that doesn't happen and i gotta wonder how much uh people were in his ear on the camp of going back to college and it really wasn't his choice you know what i mean there was Mm -hmm. probably a lot of different people in his ear about what to do and ultimately he's 19 years old he made his choice and the blues and jimmy snuggerud move on for another year Here's the other thing, too, and I know a lot of people, because I was very confused when I saw this, because I haven't seen this personally happen before where you have this situation going on. Now, the Blues have Snuggeroo's rights until until August 15th, 2026. If not signed by then, he will become a free agent or become a UFA. When you hear that, the people are like, wait a minute, this is a possibility. And we have a text that came in from the 314. Do you think it's a case that Snuggeroo doesn't want to sign here as the reason he keeps waiting? I don't know. Uh, the, the Scott Perunovich was in the identical situation, and the Blues wound up signing him even after he did reach free agency. I, I, I don't know. That's always a possibility. That's not something that he said to uh, Jeremy Rutherford, and now we have precedent for players saying, I don't want to play for that organization, right, with the, uh, the uh, Cutter Gauthier with the, the Flyers yes. who got traded to Anaheim. So if Suggeru didn't want to play here, he can just say, I, don't, uh, I didn't sign because I don't want to play there. He could also change his mind. He can. You know, Mm -hmm. this summer he could just say, you know, I've I've done more thinking about this and I want to turn pro and I want to be a part of this. That easily could happen. And maybe he just didn't feel comfortable down the stretch run with the Blues being in a playoff chase. And I I can understand that to an extent. And I also could understand if he changed his mind this summer and said, sign me up and I'm ready to go. By the way, to to that text, here's a quote from Suggerud to Jeremy Rutherford. They're the team that drafted me, and I'm excited to see if they can make this playoff run. I have so much respect for the staff there and everyone that has helped me through this uh, through this situation, Armstrong especially. He's such a great person, and he has my best interests in mind. I'm so happy to see the Blues succeed. So that leads me to believe, and he, he doesn't have to necessarily be telling the truth, but that leads me to believe that he really is not averse to playing for the Blues. No, that, that would be a big lie if he <laughs> says that. I mm-hmm. hope that that's not the case because that's not a great way to introduce yourself to the NHL, not only the Blues organization. I believe him in this situation. I think that just based off the quotes and everything he was saying, Jeremy Rutherford of The the Athletic has a great write-up on this. It seems like he really did just want to return to Minnesota and help them win a national championship. Randy, you had a great question about NIL and where that sits. And actually, the women's team and some of those individuals are making more than the men's team. In Minnesota, yeah, the women's team gets more NIL money than the men's team. So there's almost no chance that what Jimmy Snuggerud would make from NIL at Minnesota would offset the potential of the $925,000 that he could make for the Blues. Maybe I'm just not thinking logically, and I'm just thinking with my heart, but I just wanted to see him play. Yeah, and even Heard if it so was much next about him, year, bring him up. Yeah, I, I want to see him. And, and if they didn't sign him this year, fine. But I would have liked to have seen him get on track for next season because, as we've seen with Robert Thomas, as we've seen, we saw it with Alex Petrangelo, we saw it with Eric Johnson. 
it's really hard for a young player, for a rookie in the NHL, to be a great player. It takes time to marinate, and it's going to take time as much college as he plays. He can play his senior year. It's still going to be an adjustment year or two for Snuggerud in the NHL. And that's where I was. You know, I mean, just get your feet wet, get a little taste of the NHL, see how it is, and understand maybe some of the things you got to work on this summer realizing in practice and in travel and in playoff hockey what it takes to compete at this level. Yep. I mean, those are things that are very important going down the stretch with him. Speaking of going down the stretch, we're going to do so on this oh edition my. of the opening yes. drive. We've got Rock and Roll next on 101 ESPN. Hey, if you're thinking about selling your home like somebody earlier was and ask Uncle Randy, you need to get in touch with Gloria Lou, and you can call her at 314-325-6888 or visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com. Now, for a lot of home sellers, you're realizing that a cash offer might be the best solution, but unlike a local investor or real estate agent that gives you one option, Gloria Lou has a lot of options. She can help you sell your home for the most money and in the shortest amount of time. And that's because she already has buyers. She's able to guarantee the sale of your home in writing because the buyers are there. It's a collection of buyers, thousands of them, that she has put together over the course of 20 years. Gloria has an exclusive database of people looking to buy in your neighborhood and in your price range. That's how Gloria nets you the most money and creates the highest demand. Gloria sells for more and sells faster when compared to your average agent. Call Gloria Lou today, 314-325-6888 or visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com.
Let's rock. Let's rock today. Here on the opening drive on 101 ESPN, heading down the stretch. Matthew, what do you got for us? We're going to talk about where we're going to be tomorrow, Randy. Uh, we're going to be over at Ballpark Village. It's going to be fun. And we hope you'll join us 7 to 11 tomorrow. Let's roll the dice. 7 to 11. And we're going to be broadcasting live from the Budweiser Brew House at Ballpark Village for the home opener. The opening drive, that's us, will be there. BK and Ferrario will be there. The fast lane will be there from 2 to 6. All coming to you live tomorrow from BPV. The opening day broadcast brought to you by Swiss Air Heating and Cooling, Holiday World and Splash and Safari, and by Budweiser. All right, let's jump into rock and roll. We know that the uh, there's there's a pretty good matchup coming up in the women's final four. And in fact, let's just uh, rewind really quickly. This was March 26th, and this we're going to go to UConn head coach Gino Ariema, who had some very poignant thoughts about his leading score. You know, we have the best player in America. Just saying that because the numbers in this world of analytics, the numbers say that she is, and the whole stat sheet says that she is. And everybody that watched knows it. And we're uh, fortunate. He's, of course, talking about his leading score, Paige Beckers. But now he has Caitlin Clark coming up on the other side. And now Gino Ariema yesterday might have changed his tomb across the week. Here was Gino Ariema at the podium yesterday. I, I hope, I hope, I hope Caitlin Clark had a personal agenda against LSU. And I know there's nothing personal between me and her, so I, I don't need to be seeing her drop 50 on us next weekend, you know? So I love her. I think she's the best player. Forget I ever said Paige is the best player in the country. I think she's the best player that I, of all time. I don't know whoever said that I said that Paige is the best player in the country. <laughs> Good for him. Gino immediately starts backtracking. I no, love that. I don't blame him either. Uh, I don't either. You don't want to get uh, Caitlin Clark fired up, but I think she probably already is. I would say so. She's in the Final Four. They beat their nemesis. They go to the Final Four, and she's got a chance to be center stage. And uh, I would assume that the ratings for those games will be off the charts. I would think so. Oh, the ratings will be, and they have been off the charts so far. Paige Beckers is a really good college basketball player. She dropped 28 points in their last win. But at the same time, it's hard to match up against Caitlin Clark and what she's doing right now. I don't know how you slow her down. He also said a little bit later on the press conference that he's tried to call around to some coaches who have been able to slow her down. And he's not getting any answers because nobody's been able to do it this season. The one team that did was last year LSU in the championship game where they just let her go. But how do you, if you are a team that's played 35 games and haven't had to guard a logo three, how do you get somebody out there to guard a logo three? Face guard her everywhere yeah. she goes. Yeah. Uh, Box and one? I don't know, man. <laughs> that, uh, that's all. Sh that's what Shane Battier would do to uh, Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant talked about how he would get so annoyed playing Shane Battier because Shane Battier wouldn't worry about like staying, like necessarily like staying in front of him or contesting his shot. It was just always just put a hand in front of his face and just annoy him that way. By the way. Speaking of the TV ratings, 12.3 million viewers on Monday night, which is 33 percent higher than any women's college basketball game ever. But here's the best part of it. Last year's NBA Finals went five games. The only game of the NBA Finals that drew more than Iowa and LSU on Monday night was game five, the clinching wow. game for Denver. Yeah, they, I they, they had more viewers than all four of the first games of the NBA Finals and more than any World Series game last year, too. I think it was like, a tw like the last full finals where you average it out that, that that's better than that game is like 2017. Like you got to go back a few years to find an NBA Finals that got that kind of viewership. And by the way, ESPN did a profile last month all on Caitlin Clark, and this, this was a, a, an interesting poll from them. She was recruited by a lot of big programs, including Notre Dame, but UConn never actually recruited her. And she said, honestly, it was more I wanted to be recruited by them to say I got recruited. I I loved UConn. I think they're the coolest place on earth, and I wanted to say I got recruited by them. She apparently grew up loving UConn and Maya Moore, but uh -huh. maybe a little bit in the back of her head about never getting recruited yeah. by Gino. St. Louis and Maya Moore, by the way. It's like uh, Zach Eady. Zach yeah. Eady has kind of made it a personal affront with a lot of the uh, the teams that didn't recruit him, and he wound up at Purdue. Yeah, he called out Rick Barnes. That was yes, funny. he did. He was overlooked. Even though it's hard to over, we made a joke, Rock and I did, about that it's hard to <laughs> overlook him. And there was one person who didn't like that. We were joking because it's hard to overlook him considering he's seven foot four. Yeah, right, exactly. I also <laughs> really wish I, I I need to find some like high school tape of Zach Eady because he was a seven footer. Like he was he was tall in high school. He wasn't like Anthony Davis who went from like six five to seven foot like at the very end of high school. Like he he was at IMG Academy 
as an oversized player, and he was still only a three-star. Mm. And so I'm just, like, wondering, like, what was some of that high school tape look like? Maybe the only three-star in the history of IMG Academy. <laughs> That's, and so that just kind of shocked yeah. me. So to his point, comparatively, you expect to be a seven-footer going to IMG. You expect yeah, everyone to be lauding over you. Yeah. No one did. I kind of get it a little bit more. Did, they, did David Robinson go from six seven yeah. to seven-foot in, in the Navy? They, he couldn't yes. be in submarines anymore. Yeah. He was too tall. <laughs> yeah. Literally, he was too <laughs> tall. so cool. Yeah, yeah. They, had to do, like, they had to find, like, a PR thing for him to, like, uh, finish out his Navy service. Yes. Which, because uh, he, yeah. he, could, he couldn't be on a boat. He couldn't be on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they say Zach Eady was, like, ranked in the 400s? Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Well, it's, it's crazy. That's amazing. Because, like, I, I understand a, a tall player slipping through the cracks, but when you're at IMG and, like, it, does, it seems like those guys are always front and center. Sure. Every coach, every recruiter. It's kind of wild to me. And here's the thing. And I, this might be unfair, but... If Purdue was going after the guy, then Conzo Martin should have been going after the guy, too. Right? Because Matt Painter uh, and Conzo Martin are uh, recruiting the exact same players, right? Well, Paul Lusk. Yeah. That's another one that yeah. comes to mind. Conzo Martin said Ryan Kalkbrenner wouldn't have the body to compete in the SEC. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Good. Well, that's the way it goes. Seven-footers are seven-footers. Yep. And now you have a seven-foot-five guy and yep. really compete in the SEC. Cards this afternoon, 3 o'clock on Bally. And uh, then tomorrow they're home for the home opener. And we invite you to come down and visit us at Ballpark Village from 7 to 11. 101 ESPN will be there all day long. Brought to you again by Swiss Air Heating and Cooling, Holiday World, and Splash and Safari, and by Budweiser. Great job today by our producer, audio, video engineer, the one, the only, Matthew Rocchio. Thank you. Pleasure. And people will have the chance to meet Matthew tomorrow. He's going to be with us at Ballpark Village, so that'll be oh, fun. Nice. Oh yeah, right. I, yeah. I think this is. This, I think it's like this is the second time I've been on remote with the show. Oh, it'll be good. It'll we be were great. at a golf course one time. Uh, Brooke, did you have fun today? Yes, of course. Uh, I am glad about that. Danny Mac, you're the best. You too, buddy. Pleasure. It's always fun. And we thank you for tuning in, texting in, and being a part of the show. We have a balloon party with T Mac and Ajax coming up, oh. followed by by what? Uh, no T Mac and Ajax. No. No, it's a balloon party with Josh Innes and me. Oh, okay. Well, we're looking awesome. forward to that. And uh, then after that, then you've got BK and Ferrario, followed by the Fast Lane from 2 to 6 here on 101 ESPN. And for all of us, we thank you for tuning in, texting in, and being a part of the show. Until tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, have a great hump day, St. Louis. That's right. I'm going to be making my way over to Mentality this afternoon. Man, I feel so much better because I use Mentality. And I was one of those guys who felt like, okay, I'm getting older. 